<laughs> Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Uh, joining me, as always, is my co-host, Tom. He's back again. What's up, Tom? Hello, friends. I, I, I say that because you were here Saturday, not because you've been here in the normal show for almost a month, but you were here Saturday. Details. Yeah, Details. sure. Uh, in fact, I believe it has been a full month, as a matter of fact. Also joining us, the whole crew's here. It's Tyler. What's up, buddy? Mm. They do both exist. Absolutely. Yeah. I still don't think I'm caught up on Tom covering me, unfortunately. So I probably uh, do still have some. I, I don't know. Else, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're caught up. Are we caught up? All right. All right. I Excellent. Mean, no, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, right off the rip, uh, welcome everybody. We're going to be talking about the new General's Handbook today. Uh, if you're excited to get into the details, you know, give give that a like. Uh, hit that button there. It's nice. It helps other people find the show right as we kick off. So hit that button. But uh, as always, we're going to start off with some news. Tom, what do we got? This is your part where you talk. Rumor engine? Uh, yeah, sure. The thing that way before we started, you literally said, it's cool. I've got it open. I'm ready. No. So what you don't understand, Vince, let's just qualify it. What you don't understand is I was actually opening up YouTube so that I could view the comments, but I was making sure it was muted. But in order to do that, I muted myself. Like I turned off the volume so it wouldn't uh, like pop up when it started, like when the clip auto started. And then when I turn, when I unmuted, everybody was silent, and I'm like, mm, <laughs> "I suspect it's news." <laughs> Good inference. Uh, it's a weird, twisty, mutated arm thing with a post through it. It's upside down, or maybe I don't know. I you mean, know it kind of looks like a butt. It's not. It's a not. Butt. I know it's not, but one, it one heck of a buzz. Hmm. You got you got a weird perception of what butt look, butts look like. Yeah, um, yeah. I like I don't know what it concerns me about what your butt looks like. Um, <laughs> but the like my I mean I I don't know it's a it's a weird arm thing. Sure, why not? Okay. Yeah, I don't it's know. What to, I, like, it. Yes, I don't know what to say about it. It's it is weird. Uh, um, it's the end of the hand that rocks the cradle or something like where the where somebody falls on a on a beam. It's like you know how. How people die in, in movies where you fight in construction sites, you know, yeah, they like fall off and then posts, little metal pins and posts go through them and stuff. Yeah. Mm. That checks out. Sure. All right, cool. What else we got? Um, so we had this weird war cry announcement release yesterday. Yeah. Um, Crypt of Blood, also yep. known as nefrata uh nefrata bust with bonus models with bonus models yeah that's right that's right yeah i remember ben cantor uh had, had gone to some ex great length to sculpt a nefrata bust if only he would have known he could have just waited a short mm -hmm. amount of time and and then had this here um so this is two starter war or two war bands from underworlds that have already appeared in other products in fact if memory serves the Stormcast that are here have actually appeared in, like, two or three other products. Like, they mm. were originally from Harrowdeep, I think. And then they went Sounds to right. Nether yeah. Maze. And mm. now they're here in the Gnarlwood. These these three just, boy, I'll tell you, Sigmar needs to give these guys some bonus pay. Uh, they're getting into all the scrapes. They're just carving their way through skirmishes. Yeah, yeah. So this is like a starter mini set of reprint models because it's just for Warcry, but it's like a small starter set. So let's name that price. What do you think the price is? Eighty dollars. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I just a guess. You just I, asked me. I gave yeah. you a number. I don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. I'm not even that familiar with the pricing scheme of of this stuff. Warcry. Et I'm gonna go. If I'm not be if I'm gonna be conservative, I actually think it's gonna be fifty nine ninety five. Wow, 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 wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about the four pieces of knockoff Garden of Moor terrain that are in here. Okay, which are yeah. like two yeah. solid walls and two little fancy walls. You can kind of see them in the picture a little bit. Then you have the crypt, 
the actual crypt crypt the thing in the front left of the picture <laughs> and you have the neferata bust yeah uh, the sarcophagus yeah 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 sorry yeah sarcophagus that's correct you're right um I mean, the vampires are obviously cool. They're one of the best Underworlds war bands of all time. So, like, yeah. I'm not I've sad about another box with these them. dudes. Yeah. yeah. But it's a weird war cry box because these are clearly, like, less, uh, less, I don't know what to say. This is less than a full war band, right? Like, mm, these guys correct. are part of, you could, you mm -hmm. could previously in the last season take these guys as part of your war band and, like, you, you still had more models. Yeah. Um, so, okay, cool, fine. I mean, like, repurposing... So, Underworlds and Warcry have been bleeding together. This is just the continuation of that journey. Uh, Greasy Panham asked if the terrain was part of the Garden of Morse. It's funny you asked that, because we had this conversation <clears throat> right before the show started. And in fact, I've spent a lot of hours on Garden of Moore. Sure. And... None of the terrain that's actually in this box is in Garden of Moore. Now, in this image... They are using see, the Garden of Moore in the background. There is a Garden of Moore in the background. That little, yeah. the little, like, mausoleum in the back, the top left. Um, that is from the Garden of Moore, but that's not actually in the box. So the pieces right. that are coming in the box do not actually have any Garden of Moore in it. Yeah, they look like they belong in the garden of more but they're not right yeah they're definitely not they just more. look like if somebody slightly re-sculpted those basically yeah it's a really curious decision right because they they have to have the molds for garden of more and so the question is is like why did they not just reuse it like they've reused it eight or ten other times already like this is something they're very used to is putting garden of more in everything um but yeah, it's all uh, Jim Crimmins, it is new terrain. I'm just saying it's very it's not it's not actually the Garden of Moor. The the sarcophagus and the Nephrata bust are net new. The four yes. walls are new, but like they don't exist. But like you, you have very similar pieces in the Garden of Moor. Not exactly, but similar. Yeah, I mean all of the walls were straight in Garden of Moor. They didn't have this like swoopy up and down <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh to it. But yeah, I've spent a lot of time painting Garden of Moor, and that those pieces are not Garden of Moor. I can right. assure you. Yep. So okay. Um. Yeah. So this is neat. Uh. I I don't hate it. I love the bust. I actually like the Sargophagus a lot. Um. For skirmish games, it would make a really interesting uh, objective. Sure. You know, like that. That's a fun like piece I could paint up as an objective. Um. And the same thing for the statue. Um, the walls are fine. Um, it's fine. Uh, again, I'm hoping... Like, my estimate was that this was going to be around 60. It, if they were wanting to be super aggressive as a starter, they would price this around 50. I don't think they will. But if they were being super aggressive, that's where they would be. That's the space sure. I mean, they said very clear, it is a small starter set for Warcry. Yeah. That is what it is labeled as in the article. Now, if I want to be if I want to be cynical, it, it'll be eighty. Sure. Okay. Cool. There we go. What else we got? Um. So we did a preview show on Saturday. We did. Uh. So what I I put this on there because obviously we we already talked about all of those reveals in the not Warhammer forty thousand show, but. So I'm not going to cover those again. But Tyler, you didn't get to participate in that show, so I wanted to ask you if you had any opinions on anything you saw there. Uh, love the Linus of the Parch. I think that's the name, something yeah, like that. Sure. Incredible model. Yeah. <laughs> the The rest of the cities of Sigmar so far are not doing a whole lot for me personally, but others' mileage may vary. I actually didn't catch that show. What do you guys think of the rest of the? I mean, I'll, I'll just imagine you both like the the Manicor. Hopefully. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You, she's, she's incredible. Oh, yeah. 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 What What do you think of the rest of the? I it, it's not doing a whole lot for me personally, but that's that's just me. The rest of the COS, you guys like any of that stuff? Or the box? The box set also seemed a little underwhelming. Like, there's no guns. No, it's just I don't know. It's very basic. But sure. I'm nitpicking. Uh, I, we got rats. We got rats. Yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Tom, what do you think of the COS? Uh, I like the cab. 
Yeah. I do. I think they saw um, it. It's busy, but I like it. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Vince, they do much for like, you? Uh, yeah. CUS is like a six, six and a half out of ten for me. The Cruel okay. Boys are like a four out of ten for me. And the Skaven <laughs> War Band was like a nine out of ten. There you go. Yeah. Rats look good. Yeah. Uh, I was happy to see everybody voting in the in the comments for the review reaction, and there was a spread of opinions. I couldn't. The Cruel Boys occupied every number multiple times in a near even spread from one through ten. I have never seen such a distribution on uh, a, a release. It was incredible. It's just like if I mapped it, it would just be like, <laughs> it would just be like an even plot. You know what I mean? Like no, every just be this line of bars. <laughs> um. Anyway, I'll be curious to see how how much uh, accoutrements, how much you know, extra stuff is on the mana core itself in terms of trying to use that as a conversion piece. Obviously, like Chaos Orc Lord on mana core, sure. I mean that is an old kit, right? Oh, so yeah. if you can actually make that work without too much effort, like a like a dummy, like how, how, could a dummy like me try to do something with that for for Slaves of Darkness? Depends how a lot much of the effort? yeah, it depends how much the of the the girl is attached to the mana core, right? That's that's what it's all going to come yeah. down to. So. I'm thinking, like, did it have a lot of the COS plating, you know, Cities of Sigmar or Sigmar plating on oh, it, sure. like some of the dragons do, that sort of thing, but, sure. yeah. That stuff's easy enough to, to scrape off, um, yeah. but, but sure. All right, cool. But go back and watch that show if you haven't yet, if you've got other thoughts. All right, cool. Cool. Let's, uh, let's talk some pick of the week. Tyler, what do you want to share with everybody? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to shout out, so Dave Griffin, he posted a tweet, photo, Today of the Chaos Citadel terrain set that he painted out from Dark Fantastic Mills, printed out by the one and only Mr. Pocastro. And it looks amazing. And it actually looks like something that, again, uh, certain dummies might be able to pull off. Uh, it looked like a lot of dry brushing. So what's your guys, oh gosh, your, your guy's friend name? I should know it offhand. Uh, we hung out with him at Edepticon. Oh, damn. He's awesome. Dan, yeah. Dan Dan and his uh, Slaves of Darkness terrain that he painted up for yes. Adepticon was, it kind of felt like that style. Sure. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to give that a shout out. So the, if anybody missed it, the Chaos Citadel terrain was a Kickstarter. Uh, no longer, but it is now on Dark Fantastic Mode's website. It's just, yeah, amazing terrain. And uh, he, he launched it this week on his on his website. So that's all I got. Very nice. Tom, what do you want to share with everybody? While he's clearly taking a break, um, I also I want to spruik uh, Ninjon's video from like a week and a half, two weeks ago about like his reflections on speed painting. Yep. Um, mm. He shares a lot of kind of sentiments that I have also kind of like come to as I've I've worked with the various speed painting systems, trying to find something that like works for me, and uh, I'm just you know I'm just struggling. So um, like. Uh, yeah, there are strengths to all of it, of course, but, uh, but, um, yeah. So anyways, check it out. No, Love it's a great recommendation. I, I very much enjoyed that video. Um, my shout out is going to be for, uh, Haywo Plus, the subscription service that costs you nothing. Uh, mm. and that is to say, if you want to see, uh, some additional reactions to the Warhammer reveal, Haywo Plus... Uh, of course, the, the 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 massive industries behind that uh, got the upload for the Haywo reveal reaction uploaded onto Haywo Plus from his Twitch, and uh, it's a great time. Uh, would 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 recommend ten out of ten as always. Uh, the man is never better than when he's reacting to things. I mean, Haywo is a talented and gifted individual, but when he's giving, he gives good reaction. Uh, so it's mm. it's worth a worth a watch. Okay. Uh, all those, uh, are or will be linked down below. Uh, all right, gentlemen, let's talk about some hobby time. Uh, Tyler, what you been working on, buddy? After our <laughs> hobby show lot. last week, were you You're inspired? Right. I mean, I was. That was a really fun show. Uh, I'm so glad we did that. Yeah, it, it was a blast. I learned a lot from that show. I gotta go back and listen to it again and, and take extensive notes and have all of the references that were mentioned. Amazing show. It was really cool to see a lot of the comments, too, how much a lot of people got, got out of that show. we got to do that more often. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I played two games of the new GHB, so those were fun. Get into those later. And I've been still assembling battle systems terrain. 
Because it is a real problem that they don't sure. have actual assembly instructions. Yep. And my God, is it because I'm having to pause the videos and like go 0.25 speed to follow along because they do these cuts for like like speed forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, other than that, I, I'm in love with this cardboard train set that they put together. But the lack of instructions is a bit of a nightmare. Ah, uh, so, yes. You don't know how spoiled you are by GW until you go to companies that don't include printed instructions in their things, and you're like, what do I do with this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so which one? You said Battle Systems is what you were building? Yeah, man. You ever seen any of their stuff? Battlesystems.co.uk, I think. They, it, it's quite nice. It's just, yeah, there's, like, they, they're very aware. Like, you look at their videos, and the comments are just full of people. Like, you got, yeah, we really need some actual better videos or instructions for this stuff. But yeah, it's 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 good product. Yeah. Well, I found myself doing the same this week. No. Oh, uh, really? Um, but not with that company. Uh, okay. I picked up the starter set for Star Wars Shatterpoint. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, which is uh, sixteen or so models of your favorite uh, Clone Wars characters, um, along with like a, just a metric, like ton of plastic terrain. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a lot of time um, building terrain this week. That's all in forty millimeter, right? That's like the the uh, yeah, that's, scale. yeah, that's like yeah, just a slightly larger, yeah. So yeah, forty it sounds about right. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Nice. I'll be interested to hear your feedback on what you know what you what you think once you get some some real reps in under the belt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I'll say is this: I'm looking forward to painting the models. The models are sure. they were a pain to put together, but they're beautiful. Um, and they're, um, yeah, so it'll be fun to kind of, to give it a shot. So I've been looking for a skirmish game that I can really get into and that the kids can really get into. Of course. And, uh, hoping that uh, this might nice. be it. Very nice. Well, it has been a productive hobby week for me. Let me tell you what, I was inspired mm -hmm. after last week's show. So many things happening. So first of all, I got, uh, Commander Farsight, I think is his name, this guy. Yep. So he's all done. Uh, I'm sexy. Yeah, nice. so he's he's got his neon pink. Um, speaking of, on the towel thing, I also am now assembling the um, what is it? I, I, I the I'm mostly Riptide. through the boarding oh. Oh. Uh, patrol, and now I'm assembling the combat patrol. Like most of the boarding oh, yeah, patrols, yeah. painted out patrol. whatever the names yeah. are. I don't I don't know, man. But I assembled uh, the stealth suits and one of the heroes, and then I put this guy right. together. Which is, I think, the ghost key yeah. or whatever. Man, yeah. this thing is so cool. It's like the <laughs> coolest robot. Uh, like, I looked at these guys in pictures, and they, I was like, yeah, they're okay. And then I put him together, and he's really fun to put together. I really like the design on these guys. And I just think this is, like, one of the coolest looking robots. I gotta get some more mm. big Tau robots. Um, like, the real big ones. Because I just think these are just super sweet. I love... I mean, I, you, everybody who watches the show knows I have a deep and abiding love for robots and the towel robots are hitting the spot. <laughs> uh, so I got those. Tau, oh, good. KO, KO towel. Can you, can you somehow manage oh, to, to make that work? I don't think that's going to fit. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> no, these are just for 40 K and I'm okay with it. Oh, okay. Um, I also finished up a display piece, which is this girl. I had been working on her last week, yeah. but she's all done now. Uh, so got her all, all painted and ready to go. Um, as you can mm -hmm. see, we made a little nice, you know, flowing lava base there for her and stuff like that. And she's uh, coming up and born out of the fire. Uh, so didn't record anything on this one. This one was kind of just for me, mm -hmm. um, to be honest. Uh, I was really just focusing in on skin and like really, really, really focusing in on getting this skin in a place where I, I wanted to be there. We'll get as close mm -hmm. as I can. There you go. Pretty sweet. Um, so Is that Lilith? Huh? What's what? Is that Liliana? No, the actual piece. Oh, yeah, it's a good thing. I should say what it actually is. So this is called Night of the Zombie. It's officially licensed from Patrick J. Jones, and it's from Mindwork Games. Uh, Mindwork Games makes really excellent display figures. Couldn't recommend them enough. They're awesome. I painted another thing from them that was actually like a water-themed piece. Um, that's where the Cloaks video that I, I uploaded this last week came from. That's also from Mindwork Games. Um, so did all that. And then, as well as well, that's right, we're not done yet, folks. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Bulcastro, you mentioned him earlier, he had backed this Kickstarter full of, like, these display figures. And I didn't realize how big they were, but I started mm -hmm. working on this girl, just doing some initial sketches. Like, look at how, look at the, 
This is Commander Farsight to her. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. So she's yeah. in like 90 millimeter scale. Yeah. And uh, he sent them all to me. That was very nice of him to print those out and send them to me. These are just kind of fun things I'm messing with. Um, but yeah, this is all, there you go. She's just, like I said, this is just initial doing some light sketches and studies and stuff like that. As you can see, mm -hmm. she's like a druid with two little owlies that she's, she's hugging there. They're on her shoulders. Very um, precious. My wife fell in love with this one and wanted me to paint this one for her. So nice. that's what I'm going to do. Pretty much that, that simple. And I think that's finally all the hobby. Now that was in addition to everything else of course like I, you know, know, I had to get kathy to figure out a model that she wants painted that she can give <laughs> to me so that's, uh, okay. uh, I have to sure. have to think more about that yeah. yeah that's also in addition to working on more stuff of course for snarling badger uh working on our next game and a whole bunch of other stuff going on and getting everything ready for our as tom mentioned uh, uh i don't know if you mentioned this this might have been before we went live mm -hmm. whatever getting everything ready for a D, &D marathon this weekend so i won't have much chance to hobby uh basically until we do this show next week so mm. um so i'm getting it all in now uh but it's there been a go. busy 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 week i actually had a nice couple days had the holiday and i got to spend a lot of it hobbying so i just you know went to work it was great uh <laughs> all right cool uh with that gentlemen are you ready to talk about the G, the H, and the B. The nope. General's GB, Handbook. G, G, B, H. We've talked about this. You said it wrong. G, B, H. Thank you. General's right. Book Hand? What? Yes. No. That's 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 a very niche AOS Coach reference. Oh, okay. It's, it. it's, it's fine. <laughs> I missed that. All Love right. Love you, Coach. Uh, so, uh, oh, here's... <laughs> Anthony said he didn't expect any of those to be out of the box for a long time, if ever. Nah, man, they're all assembled. They're all in my shelf. And then my as soon as I, I had them out and was looking at it, my wife came down and she was like, I really like that one. You should paint that one for me. And it's like, all right, well, guess that mm. project order is decided. All right, let's talk about uh, the General's Handbook. Okay, before I even get to the overview slide, let's just start with some key words, okay? Hmm. Magic, anti-magic, 12-month season, all new battle plans, all new battle tactics, same basic battle pack, i.e. the core rules. Okay, there we go. That's my, those are my sort of keywords, right, that I would say. How long does it last? The full 12 months, everything else is new and the actual functional stuff, and it's a magic versus anti-magic season. Yep. Okay. I'm um, hope hope you're happy. You got your way. Twelve months. Um, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. Magic doms. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. A, and the monkey's paw curls. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um. All right. Cool. Let's talk overview. As I said, this is a magic focus season. The focus is on you know magic and anti magic as always. As with most of these seasons, which side wins is, I guess, is left to be seen and can shift over time. My initial money is on anti-magic. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, just as with the last two seasons, there are armies that are going to be left out in the cold here. Like, not everybody gets to play in this pool equally. As long as we keep this up, we're going to, we're going to keep just having armies that just basically are slightly garbage uh in in the current season because they just don't have the right rules to play in this kind of pool uh and some of these spells like the new spells are really really big when we the spells i'm gonna say it this way tyler i'm gonna see we'll see what you think about this hot take you ready you ready All right. mm. okay the spells are the bounty hunters of this season thoughts uh, i well uh, maybe one spell yeah yeah probably closer to true than not true okay. i don't think we're gonna we're we're not full-on bounty hunters but closer to true than not true yes it's not a one-to-one -one because like you take bounty hunters it's not much you can do to counter that out of your list building phase right you either have the thing that they're destroy or you don't yeah um 
whereas the spells, obviously, spells are that. Now, one thing I'll say here is, Matt, the reason I'm not excited about this season, I'm going to be straight up with everybody. I, like, I actually think there's a lot of good stuff in this season, but I'm not excited about this season as a whole. And mm. the reason for that is very simple. I don't think Magic in AOS is a very good system. I think it's the swingiest, most e unevenly distributed system across the game. That is the like it's the highest impact, most unevenly distributed thing. And would you say more? Hold on. Like, would you say more so than Battle Tome Battle Tactics? Yes, because it's much more impactful. And but the, if mm. you're using those, they are un more unevenly distributed that, of haves and have nots. I think they're at and, least as equally distributed. If not still, if not, mean, not as bad. There are, there are like the best battle tome dom, battle, battle tome, battle tactic dom dunks two for free. Maybe two and a half sure. for free. Right. Okay. Right. The best right. spell dom casts every spell <laughs> and does not get stopped outside of auto dispel. Right, but that doesn't determine mm. game. Like what? I'm, what? It, like, like I, I've watched Caleb play Zinch. I disagree. No, no, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, is that um, Magic can also, I don't know. Like I, I would push back about. You would it say being... Magic can also do absolutely nothing. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. I yes. completely agree. That's why I said it's a completely swingy, ridiculous system. Unless you're like, if you're a spell dom. And in, in one of those few chosen forces, your magic's not swingy. Your magic is incredibly reliable by the standards I of understand. that system. Certainly. Right? Certainly. It, it moves Certainly. into the bounds of like attacking on twos and threes. Of okay? course. You of don't course. hit every time attacking on twos or threes, but you're reliable enough. Yes. Okay. But everybody else, magic is just like an all over the, the board system. You could have, like, I've had whole games of just average magic armies where. I just don't cast a spell. Not because everybody unbinds it, but because I'm like, need a six, got a four. Need a five, got a two. Miscast, great. Okay, my magic's done, right? And then next round, I'm like, fail. And then I get one off, they're like, they roll and they unbind it. I'm like, cool, two rounds down, no spells, right? That's a very common experience. Right. Yeah? Right. So what I'm saying is the reason, this is a foundation of sand. We have decided to build an entire season. A That's year long argument. season. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean I think it's bad. I actually think there's, a, as I said, I want everybody to hear me really clearly. I think there's a lot of good stuff in this season. We'll talk about it as we go through it. But this castle is built on sand, and the ground underneath it will shift a lot. That is what I will say. Okay? All right. So those that's that's my quick overview. Uh, Tyler. What's your what's your what's your initial forty thousand foot view? Then I'm gonna go to you, John. Well, okay. So you uh, do you have, I'm not watching the stream? Do you have the slide up where you you have the overview slide up? I have the overview slide up. Okay, right. So you've got here, as with mostly seasons, which side wins is left to be seen. It can shift over time. My money is on anti magic. Maybe before I say anything, you, you haven't really said anything about why your money is on anti magic and what you mean by that. Could you it, clarify that? Yeah, it's more generically good. There are really powerful anti magic factions in. It shuts down the the spell person who who can like dunk with the new spells, just blows through four opponents and then hits the hard anti magic and loses almost instantly. Like the game suddenly mm -hmm. flips to them being like thirty percent chance to win. Like all else being by, equal. By anti magic, are you talking about armies that that have like negation on a five plus, or what do you? How are you yeah. specifically corn? Uh, uh, the, the We're Magic Proof OBR, that's really the big one. Like, the We're Magic Proof OBR, just knocking down attack spells on a two-up is, like, pretty sure. darn good. But, like, Corn especially also has lots of good abilities to interact with magic in negative ways. Uh, the Skulls, they have auto-unbinds, they're highly resistant to magic, and it feeds their blood tithe. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like, Corn has a lot of powerful tech, uh obr has a lot of powerful tech like and and then you still have the problem of if you run into other spell domes who might outdo you right like you're rolling hot until you get into the seraphon guy who's even better than you right so like you can get it from both sides people can run to your left or your right and and beat you on your strat is my point okay yeah my pushback would be i think that there may be play in augment 
like augmentation magic, um, which will basically completely ignore the OBR like stuff. Sure. So like I think about those that are playing in the spaces of, of like self buffing, mm -hmm. even like core frost, even, even that one. Oh, we're going to talk like, about the self, best self buff in the game. Yep. Sure. Right. Like you can turn that on yourselves and that kind of anti magic doesn't play well. Like corn still plays well, but like the OBR super negation doesn't do anything against it. Sure. I mean, a bunch of stormcast dragons with two knight and cantors. Seems like a pretty good, seems like a pretty good list. Four up spell ignore on your whole army and uh, two auto dispels. In general, yeah, two knight encantors plus the Antorian acolytes battalion probably is is pretty interesting to order in general as an allies option. So, so uh, anyways, overall, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah that's, absolutely. That's why my so, money's on anti magic to actually win out at the end. Okay, so I mean that's broadly defining anti-magic is where that broadly defined anti-magic winning out is where or certainly being elevated is where my mind is at and that's been my experience at least so far it's only two games but that was my read and that has been my experience so far in two games one pure null stone adornments no wizards the other a knight and cantor and a lord arcane among griff charger against zinch with a pretty good zinch list and so there's a lot of nuance to that, which I don't necessarily need to get into right now because it involves like getting into the, the details, right? So I can sit on that. But I think the, as usual, political economy terms, the, the class curve here is going to be a little more flattened. There will be a little um, more equity in the ecosystem, a little less inequality. I can see an argument in some ways the rich get richer, but in general, I do think the, the inequality will lessen. Uh, the middle class will get stronger. Oh, wow. and... completely disagree <laughs> this is it. okay no, we no, can no. Do this, that. Is, this is full on feeding money to the billionaires like this is a hundred percent the rich get richer as i say so, right here in the text if yeah. you're picturing you doing this stuff okay like oh look at these sweet spells i'm gonna do them no you're not no 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 no, no. i'm talking about unbinding years. unbinding this, oh, this i'm specifically thinking the, about the unbinding. equity of unbinding uh yes. sure we'll talk about that when we get to pmd and how i think i think Maybe unbinding is the Maybe. interesting part, and a lot of yeah, what I what I think of inequity or of equity increasing in the ecosystem is is on the unbinding side. Yeah, uh, sure. that's yeah, that's that's function. probably enough for now. Another reason why I think anti magic is going to win out because in the end, the, you're you're way more incentivized to use them for for unbind than you are for casting. But anyways, uh, go ahead, Tom. I don't want to jump all over your thoughts. No, no. I mean, I think that like I just I think that. Uh, I would agree that your spell doms are going to take over. Like you're, you're. They're just going to get those in the middle class are just going to get dunked on. Yeah. Um, because of those, uh, because of because they are fighting a battle on two ends. They're fighting a battle against the anti magics on one side and against the spell doms on the other. Yeah, yeah, sure. Completely dunked um, on. Like your magic is your. If you're a middle class magic army, like yeah. maybe you got one one guy or girl with a plus one to cast forget it magic isn't a thing for you this season that's over right turn that off that doesn't count anymore you don't do that yep well i don't know again i don't know i mean to me you're making two arguments you're talking about the swinginess that is so inherent to the system while also i'm hearing you convey like a sense of uh highly deterministic outcomes sure and what like, is going to happen here. don't get me wrong i like i am using hyperbole i'm not gonna lie like i'm, I'm talking sure. about it like it's a <laughs> foregone conclusion but what i mean is like the number of spells you will get off per game will drop dramatically percentage wise period if you're in the middle class like it will drop like a rock will you still occasionally cast spells sure when you have two middle class when the middle class fights itself as it were right yeah then yeah it's gonna be an interesting game with like where the pmds actually do something but the second, but like the number of anti magic, number of people playing anti magic will go up. So, hence, mm. that's just going to increase in the ecosystem. So, you will run that's to that more and yeah. they will shut you off. The that number of likely, spell yeah. bombs will increase because they want to use their strat and they will shut you off. So, yeah. both of your natural enemies who are going to stop you from doing, oh my God, Tom, turn off <laughs> everything that dings, shut off your other <laughs> crap. How hard is it? I, have, I don't know what you're talking about. Turn, I'm mute totally your phone, 
turn off your other apps. I swear to I Jesus. <laughs> I don't think it's me. Great. It's a great prank, Tom. It is most definitely you. <laughs> okay. No. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Now. So like so that's my point. If you have like a good old fashioned, you know, Iron Jaws on Nurgle fight, it's gonna be an interesting sure. time with PMD. Like what a what a great that's gonna be a fun game. Sure. Right? Sure. Like that's gonna be people using primal magic dice and just going nuts and having a weird old wacky time. Right? Yeah. But but like that is not gonna be the norm, as it were. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get into the details because we keep talking de details, but we're we're not we're not there yeah. yet. All right, let's actually yeah. explain to everybody what we're what we're talking about here. Rocky says it was his phone. Darn it, Rocky! Jeez. See, I told you it wasn't <laughs> me. Man. It wasn't me. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna shaggy it. Uh, arrested at the Waffle House said more dings, louder dings. I veto arrested at the Waffle House's vote, despite how good his his name is. Uh, as I've said many times, the absolute best name on YouTube, right there. Like. Dude, if you ever actually make a channel, or if you have a channel, you need to tell me, because I'm going to subscribe immediately. I don't want to talk about anything. <laughs> I just want to be subscribed to Arrested at the Waffle House. <laughs> All right. Uh, mm. Basic battle pack rules the same, i.e. like points, required units, allowed units, all that. Reinforcement points, you know, yada yada. All that crap's the same. Cool. We can move past that. All right. Wizard heroes with a wounds characteristic of nine or less that are not unique become an Antorian locus. Oh boy. Do we have to make these words impossible to pronounce? Is that just the, is that the goal every time? Okay. So they become an AL. They become an Andy. Andes. I'm going to call them Andes. <laughs> there, there we go. go. They become an Andy. So remember, Andes can't be unique. <laughs> can't have more than nine wounds. Okay. You guys have Andes in Ohio? Frozen, frozen custard? Andes frozen custard? No, we no, have a thing. No, no, we, we're mean... dominated here in Ohio by a thing called Wits. Ah, uh, okay. Frozen All custard. right. Quit with an H. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, optimal focus. Uh, at the start of the battle round, after priority is determined, the player taking the second turn can pick one friendly hero on the battlefield. If it's an Andy, you get to attempt to cast one extra spell and unbind an extra spell in that battle round. If they are not an Andy, you get a command point that can only be spent to allow that hero to issue a command. Okay, so here we have our first incentive for going second. I'm going to I'm going to put a pin in that for now. We're just going to pin that right up here in the corner. I want everybody to just picture a little thing that says this is a pretty decent bonus for going second. When we get to the battle plans later, this is going to become relevant. <laughs> okay. All right. So... That's the basics uh, of, of, like, the basic realm rules. Mm. Uh, let's talk about who our winners and losers are. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. So I've got some potential winners and losers here. I added this slide since I sent this to you guys. Suck mm. it. Uh, that's what <laughs> I do. Okay. Potential winners and potential losers. Potential. Gracier. He can cast on 3d6. It's pretty easy for him to actually get like bonuses to cast uh, in various and sundry different ways. Um, so, that's pretty great. And, yeah. He's, he's good. He's a, he's a good dude. Like, he can cast on 3d6. I don't know what else to say. So, you know, it's good. <laughs> Anybody who can cast on 3d6. I didn't, I couldn't find a picture to represent Cabalists, but you can just figure that they're in there too. I thought if yeah. I put up the logo, no one would know what the logo is for them, but Cabalists. 3D6 wizards, of which here I'm using the grace here. <laughs> right. Uh, the blue scribes. Oh boy, the blue scribes. Who can once mm. around just be like, uh, cast a spell on a two up. Now they are... Uh, uh, the blue scribes are... Hold on. Um... Are they... Yeah, because they're... Are they unique? I couldn't remember. No, oh. They are. They're unique. I believe yes. so. Yeah, oh, they're sure. unique. So they're not an Andy, oh, okay. but they can cast a spell on a two-up. Great as part of an overall strat. So they're not going to be your Andy. Okay? Right. 
but they're a great piece. The reason I still think they're a winner, let me explain, because they're they're not an Andy. I was like 99% sure they were unique when I put them in here, mm. is because people are going to have a bunch of auto unbinds. Yeah? Correct. Mm. Correct. Okay. And, and they can push through your one spell. Correct, because it can't be unbound. So, like, what I'm using for them is I'm using them to force through, like, mm -hmm. the Zinch spell I want. Okay? Yep. And then yep. I don't have to worry about my opponent using Primal Magic Dice to try to unbind me. Is everybody right. with me now? Because specifically yep. when they do this on a two-up, it can't, it can't be unbound. What's the unbind target? Impossible. It says it cannot be unbound. So... Yeah. That's why I think they're really strong, right? So things that both either cast real high or things that just cast on a number and hence ignore uh, yeah. the primal magic dice being more potent and unbinding. Okay? Right. Okay. Cool. We all understand there. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, no, I'm not picking Hollow Heart because I don't know what Hollow Heart does. Like, Hollow Heart will have a new book in five seconds. So, I mean, like, I, I know right. it does now, it's, but... It... Hollow Heart's not a real thing. Right. Like, mm -hmm. almost no one's playing Cities, and Cities won't have its existing rules for more than, you know, another... Almost nothing, as far as time goes. Um, Because I would expect that book will be out in, like, the, the... I would expect that box to release in, like, August, probably. So, I mean, you know, you'll have, like, four mm -hmm. to six weeks. So, it, it just doesn't count. Um... <clears throat> The Knight in Cantor, uh, who, who is an Andy uh, for their own casts, but also has an auto unbind. They come with a dispel mm -hmm. scroll. So that's pretty good. Um, again, like, you know what shuts off somebody using a ton of primal magic dice to get a really high number as long as they don't roll two sixes? We'll talk about primal magic dice in a moment, what the heck I'm even talking about. Uh, mm. But somebody who auto unbinds. So. Yep. There you go. And then I also like the Lord Arcanum on Griff Charger this season a lot, specifically in relation to the grad strategy, keep a wizard alive. He's got a built-in teleport, eight wounds, three up save, uh, nice spell, healing spell. Just, yeah, I think it, it's a nice option for Stormcast in my mind. And also an Andy. Does not fit in the battalion, the Acolytes battalion, but can have everything. Sure. And then the Salon. I mean, the Salon is like an absolute yeah. wrecking ball house in this season. My God, that fat frog. Like, <laughs> if there was ever a season meant for him, he is domination. You know, I see a lot of people talking about, like, the power of, of say, plus two to unbinders or something like that, or plus one to unbinders. I don't think that's anything. I really don't. I don't think that matters for anything. Primal Magic Dice will, will when they're used, be pushing your number, uh, your cast number up by an average of three for every die. Okay? Right. So, like, unless your bonus to unbind is absolutely massive, right, then it's not doing enough work for me. Because because yep. all of the casters who are going to dominate are going to be casting on either way more dice or having giant bonuses, right, or, or both. Yep. So just, like, being a cool dude with a plus two to unbind, like, that's neat. It's a neat trick. You might be good for normal spells. You're not going to do anything against against the actual people against the spells they're trying to power out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll wait until we do go through the primal dice in terms of yeah giving yeah, giving more. Yeah, we got a lot to unpack. There. <laughs> Potential yeah. losers of the end and of the Andy fight, uh, fire slayers. I'm using them here kind of to represent just armies that don't really have wizards, like of which there are a couple. I mean, so aren't really playing here. It doesn't necessarily make them a true loser. Like I said, if the anti-magic wins, and, and hey, I guess the age of that, they still have that spell banner that's like a four-up spell ignore, right? That still exists? They do. They yeah. do. Uh, yes. Uh, no, the Hades, the wizard, can be mounted. Yeah. It's, they can, it's just nine wounds or less can't be unique. They can have a mount. They can be on a bird or a dog or a something. So, there you go. Uh, yes, we are still in Gur, Eric Doughty. Uh, and then I have the I have the Iron Jaws here, but I, I again they're standing in to represent armies that just have like, yeah, completely average, nothing special casters, right? Like, you've got a wizard. They don't really have any. You've got some wizards. They don't really have bonuses to cast. Like I could use Daughters of Cain, 
I could have I could have no. put Doc in that same position. Doc, Night Haunt, like all of them have spells that they want to get off, and none of them are going to get off spells this season. Right, right, exactly. Like, forget all of that. That's that's done. You don't cast magic anymore, right? Yep. So like, nope. <laughs> And then Sons of Bamot, who just are again not play, who have like don't even qualify in any way <laughs> because of the nature of their army. So it's just like whatever. You it's not only do you not have any locuses, you don't have the ability to really get at them outside of uh, anything really. That's 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 basically it. Um, and you know some of these spells are just gonna absolutely be incredibly impactful to you. Like I don't like Sons. You just get you just get dunked on so hard by people take leaning heavily into this magic that's in this season. Um, yep. A lot. Um, yep. Now, Suns will still have... Mm. Oh, sure. Kelly Kelly says, I, I ain't counting Suns. They appear to just ignore GHB and get a 50% win rate. Yeah, sure. Which <laughs> will probably persist because it's really easy for Suns to constantly be between 2-3 and 3-2. Hence a 50% win rate. Because they win by just standing there. They're not good games. They're not fun games. The player doesn't kill anything or do anything. It's just they get two easy wins because they walk up, stand on whatever the scenarios are where they can just stand there and win. And then they stand there and win until they die and that's it. What a, what a great time. Right? Um, so like That doesn't make their army not an incredibly painful and, and awful experience to play in this time. So, there you go. Okay. So, on uh, again, like fire slayers. Uh, what does the ash cloud rune do, Tom? Ash cloud rune. I don't know. It's been a long time uh, since I played fire uh, slayers. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, I mean, my sense of them is that they're in that. Maybe I missed it. I was just trying to research a couple things. Uh, they're in that category of again, if they really need the extra anti magic, two encantors, and an acolytes battalion. There you go. Like, and and they already have. As far as I know, they have a number of existing. They do have some. They have some decent anti magic tech built into them. Yeah, yep. I wouldn't yeah. call like they're not corn. They're not, you know, OBR or whatever. But they're or no myriad OBR. But they're they're they've got stuff. They've got tech. yeah. So have a I don't know. Have a hard time seeing them in the losers category. Depending, I may have missed how exactly you were defining that. But I mean, potential yeah. losers. Okay. So the <laughs> ash, the ash cloud uh, is a once per battle in the enemy hero phase, and when you trigger it. Units wholly within 12 of the bearer are not visible to enemy units uh, attempting to cast spells. So it basically shuts them off as potential targets for one round yep. from enemy spellcasters within 12. Or you could just yeah. play in one of the battle plans. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, my so my thing with Fire Slayers, is, is, like all the rest of this, is I don't know how it'll shake out. Like, if Anti-Magic wins and rules a day and, and really, like, Andes aren't doing anything or going anywhere and not really seen then Fire Slayers will be fine, right? Or or if there is not enough of it there that their anti-magic tech can hold them, they'll be fine, right? Yeah. Like, as you mentioned. So, but I was more using them as a stand-in for, like, people who just don't really have wizards, or you have to ally um, them in and stuff like that. Like, sure. you know, that's that's kind of less appealing for how much you get to play in this season as an Andy, right? Mm. Okay. All right. Cool. So these are your these are your potential winners and losers of the Andy world, okay? But let's talk about these primal magic dice because this is really the story, right? This is this is where it is. Okay, yeah. several things I want to talk about here. Let's go through the rules first. At the start of the hero phase, both hero phases. That is to say, like it's going to happen twice per battle round. Both players roll a dice. That doesn't actually matter. It's just two dice need to be rolled. Anybody could roll it. Your friend could walk up to the table and roll two dice. It's literally completely irrelevant mm -hmm. what human being rolls the dice. Mm -hmm. For each four plus, okay, each player receives one primal magic dice. So as distributed, they are distributed equitably. So if both players roll a four, both players get two primal magic dice. If one player rolls a four and one player rolls a one, both players get one primal magic dice and so on. I assume we can all mm -hmm. trace out the third fact pattern here. Okay. Mm. All right. 
After a player attempts to cast or unbind a spell, or after a player attempts to dispel an endless spell, they can roll one of their primal magic mm -hmm. dice. If they do so, add the result to the casting, unbinding, or dispelling roll. That player can continue to roll additional primal magic dice until the caster suffers a primal miscast, i.e. has two ones showing anywhere on all the dice they rolled, or there are no more primal magic dice to be rolled. Abilities that allow you to reroll casting, unbinding, or dispelling rolls must be used before primal magic dice are rolled, and if you reroll your casting, you can't use primal magic dice. So people like the contorted epitome or master of magic type of stuff, all that kind of thing, it's a non-bow with your PMD. Doesn't mean those abilities aren't good. You're not going to use PMDs on everything. And I imagine people will still have Master of Magic and rerolling type stuff. They'll just use it for their other spells and they won't reroll when they want to use their PMD. Like, it's mm -hmm. pretty simple. Uh, if you primal miscast, i.e. if your uh, casting roll includes a double one, the caster suffers a primal miscast, which is D3 plus 3 mortal wounds, and everybody within 3 inches of them takes D3 mortals. When you get double sixes anywhere, the spell is successfully cast and cannot be unbound. In both cases, you don't get to cast any more spells in that phase. However, if you do primal cast, if you, you know, irresistible force or whatever we're going to call it, uh, both players do receive a primal magic dice. So basically the, the, the kitty refills. Yes, PMD is primal magic dice. Yes. Okay. Them's the basics. Now let's talk about implications, boys. This is what we've been waiting on. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, I believe these will... I believe in my heart of hearts these will be FAQ to just be a modifier to your spellcast. Not not part of your spellcasting role total. There are yeah. way too many spells that will be... that will. There are way too many things in the game <laughs> that will go wonky if this is generating your casting role. Okay, like... A, right. like oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. light, techless. So light. There's there's a ton. Yeah. There's a lot. Like it goes on and yeah. on. We could we could start <laughs> and just not and name them for the next five minutes. So like yeah. for the sanity of the game, these will just be FAQ'd to be a, a a a modifier to your cast. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. What do we? Let's talk implications. Tyler, what's what's the initial implications that jumped into your head? Yeah. So like I said that. Looking at this as written, I think it does have more differ differential advantage for unbinding than casting. How much? I don't know, but but some amount. Mm -hmm. uh, there's various factors to that. So if you're an unbinder, you get full information, right? They, uh, and they're doing their casting. Okay, you get a seven. They have to decide a three and a four. They have to decide, am I going to use a primal die? So can I use one primal? Right. Then they stop. You, you get full information. Yep. There's a more inherent disadvantage or risk, opportunity cost, with casting, where you don't care about if you roll a one or a six, for that matter, when, when you're, you're unbinding, unbinding but, right. but you do, of course, when you're casting, right? Mm -hmm. Especially a one. So that inherently is a rate limiter on the use of primal dice as a caster, not so on an unbinding. Uh, those are just a, a couple of initial things that really stood out in my mind. The... Let me let me hit you with another one. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. going second in the battle round. You're yeah. Touch that pin up here, okay? You <laughs> already have an advantage because of the thing we talked about before, right? Right. There's right. going to be a lot of advantages in in uh, battle plans as well, okay? You now yeah. know the total number of primal magic dice that exist in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. And so at the start of the hero phase, you generate these dice, right? Also, yep. at the start of the hero phase, you dispel in the spells. Yep. Okay. You can use these on dispelling endless spells. Yeah. Okay. And so, like, we're not going to talk about endless spells this week because we don't have the points for the endless spells tonight. Like, they, they have new rules and stuff, but without the points, it's a completely irrelevant. Yeah. You might say it's a pointless right. conversation. Uh <laughs> But we'll we'll talk about them once we have points and stuff, which I assume will come basically with the official launch of the book and all that. Yeah. But I don't know how endless spells actually ever get used, because if I'm going second, which like the incentives to go second are just stacking and stacking and stacking, in this season, right? Because if I'm at the bottom of the round every round, not only do I get to just get the extra Benny 
from the the thing above, like an extra cast or unbind or whatever. Right. Or an extra command point if I just want that. I have a mm-hmm. bunch of bonuses in the battle plans, and I can now know, like, my opponent's not casting any more spells this round, right? It's my turn. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah? So, like, yeah. if I don't have a distinct plan to use Primal Magic to cast, yeah. then I'll just blow all your endless spells off the table. Easy peasy. Almost automatically. Mm-hmm. Because endless spells just, like, with their cast numbers, like, we were relying on the fact that you're generally rolling 2d6 against their, their number, to get them off the board, which is like sometimes hard when they're a seven or an eight to cast or something. When I get three d six or four d six against your endless spells, like pff, they're gone instantly. I so yeah, I mean the, the devil's in the details on that, which we'll get into. So when we see the endless spells, we'll have a better understanding of all this. But broadly defined, there are a number of endless spells that have been boosted in very meaningful ways that can have their impact regardless of whether that can have their impact as long as they get one turn to be on the board and do their thing. Uh, new Geminids, Pendulum running, you know, Hero sure. Phase teleports are going to be a thing potentially sure. this season, right? If you have some way, Hero Phase teleport, if you're going second, especially, you can do two spells. If you just have a base one, you could do like I mentioned to you, right? The Skink Stars here could, if if the Hero Phase, the Heroic Action teleport is a thing, we'll see tomorrow, presumably, uh, whether that's still a thing or not. But right now, you could, if I understand it, Heroic Action, that guy, teleport him, pop Celestial Doom, take away a ward, and then pop. Uh, pendulum or whatever it might be to do. So anyway, I think there are a number of examples like that where you can have real meaningful impact regardless of whether they get dispelled in the next turn. A fair point, but nonetheless, you have to agree with me that this says and the spells don't stay on the board for more than like your turn where you cast them. I think that's generally fair, yeah. Okay. Well, not yeah. only that, like, heaven forbid that they are on the board because if they're predatory, they may still eat like a sever or whatever the, the new spell is that makes them so that they're uncontrollable and also mm. battle tactic nonsense. Like I just, I really think endless spells are such a massive risk to use in this season. I, I really yeah. do. We'll, we'll talk about it as we keep going, but yeah. like in my mind, okay. What this makes me, what this season so far and like reading so far, I'm like, if I was approaching this the first time and I read up to this point, right in my head, the logical incentive that I'm res- that I'm that I'm going to respond with is I don't want to play I want to play an army that has some good anti magic options and I don't want to worry about casters at all and all these dice are just free things to shut off their best tricks and if I can back in an auto dispel into my list as well a plus I'm good to go like the aforementioned dragons double knight and cantor list I'm just like yes this is perfect this is exactly what I want all right. Because then the dice are all upside to me. I either don't care about them if we get none, or they're pure Benny if I get some. I can use them to shut off all my opponent's best tricks. I don't need them at all. I'm not relying on them, right? And I have a bunch of built-in uh, defenses against their best tricks. Like, this is okay. one of the reasons I'm saying anti-magic. Because the incentive yeah, is I so can... much user to use this as unbind. Right. Yeah. But then, then near the start, you were saying that you thought, you asked me, what do I think about the idea of that the spells, specifically the realm spells, which are only available to Antorians, are going to be the bounty hunters or the proximate, approximation sure. bounty hunters. Okay. So how, how is that squaring? I mean, uh, with maybe that, one, with that thing one. I just said, because I was talking about what I like to play, mm. not what other people like to play. And I don't generally like to play spell dom mm. armies. Like, yeah. I think spell doms right. using those things will be, will, will make people feel like, Holy crap. I just got punched in the face hard. Right? Like, yeah. that's what's going to happen. That's why I'm saying that. Again, it's not... I, it, you're right. It's it's a closer to than one than the other thing. Like, again, yeah. I'm not trying to make a full-on comparison. I'm saying it's it feels closer to that than the other way around. Yeah, okay. So, one... Maybe real quickly. One mini-game that I've noticed in terms of the, like, the if-then conditions. If-then, then this, and the In the first two games so far has been... So, first game against Inch. Uh, I was always going second, just for the sake of going second, to get the benefit, regardless of board state, going second. Okay, sure. so I could get up to four unbinds with two single unbind casters, an, an Encantor and a, and a Griff Charger, Arcanum and Griff Charger, right? So I do uh, going second, and I do Heroic Will Power with uh, Bandis or somebody else, some other hero, right? Okay, so I've got four. I did not have the Acolyte, the Antorian Acolyte Battalion. I uh, would like to get that in the list. I think that's going to be very prominent. We'll come to that. That's that's very meaningful. At the start of each hero phase, you can get, on a three-up, you can get an additional one if you have two of your Acolytes, two Andes. 
uh, on the battlefield. Okay, so against Zinch, what I was finding in the minigame was essentially, all right, I've got two options. I can either focus on the Zinch spells that my opponent's not using Primal Dice on, and then I Primal Dice against them to improve my chances of getting rid of them, right? Sure. Or I do what my opponent is doing, which is probably saving their Primal Dice or like their big Cairo spell through the spell portal or like their key spell that they're really trying to get off. Sure. So I could play that game. And then it's like a game of whose Primal Dice is going to win out, plus any bonuses or whatever. And I'm, I'm at a differential disadvantage against Zinj because they're, you know, Cairo sort of changed, they're matching the dice. So that's less. But that was the immediate mini game that I noticed in terms of playing it, which is partly what made me think that, okay, there's some meaningful, uh, lessening of inequality in the game because I've at least got more ways now to get rid of some spells. Not all spells, not even necessarily the biggest spell because that's not necessarily the most attractive, but some spells. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I think in that kind of, which is again, part of like the, I, like I said, my money's on anti-magic winning out, right? Yeah. And why ultimately I think this might actually end up being a bad season for the casters. Like, like it, which would be in line with every other season we've seen. The infantry season was bad for infantry. The monster season was bad for monsters. Like, it happens every time. So it wouldn't be weird. But, like, if you... If the logical incentive is I use the primal magic dice to basically unbind everything they don't use dice or or, or don't blow out their roll on, right? Because Zinch is also yeah. casting with a bonus, right? Right, right. So... The question is, how effective can I be doing that? And how much do they still, like, how much do the spells that they can still force through impact the game, right? Like, do right. they need those other dice? If they're making 10 spell casts a turn, right? Well, you ain't shutting yeah. off that many, right? Sure. Uh, right. So, like, is that, I, I don't disagree with your statement. I just want, like, the question just becomes, how much of an impact is that? Yeah, right. it's just, it, I, I'm, I'm right. I'm just referring to the prior baseline, which Tom said at the top, we were living in an era of true spell doms and, and everybody else. And like in that situation, I would have had much less chance in general to compete against their magic. Whereas now you've got more tools to at least curtail the, curtail a little bit what they're doing. I'll give you a maybe on that, <laughs> is my answer. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well. Tom, what about you? No, I would agree with that. Okay. Are there any other, like, natural, uh, what do I want to say, secondary consequences we want to think about here with Primal Magic Dice at this stage? Well, we've, I mentioned Hero Face Teleport, and I mean, not, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're going for, but there's certainly a lot to be sure. said in my mind about any army that can do Hero Face Teleports, right? Uh, especially going second, and if you've got ways of getting more advantage in casting. Uh, so Skaven was the first one that came to my mind because of the way, as I understand it, uh, Skitter Leap, you know, Grace here, right? Skitter Leap, 3d6 cast, potential primal magic if fueled. They could then use the Gnaw Hold to get out of dodge with the current rules as written. Correct. They don't even have to expose themselves. Okay, so, okay. Like, uh, you cannot do that with a Lord Arcanum on Griff Charger as written. It's like a little fact that I think a lot of people miss. Uh, for for what it's worth, like the the play would be translocate the Lord Lord Arcano Griff Charger. You're going second. He blasts like uh, merciless blizzard and a pendulum or something, uh, you know, twelve just right in front of the enemy, and then he gets out of dodge with ride the winds of theory. That's not possible uh, according to this fact, as at least my understanding of it. Thankfully, because that that's kind of silly. Um, but yeah, there there are a number of of wizards that I think could do that. That that could be a real challenge. I mean, especially if you can get sure. out of dodge. Again, unless the anti-magic is the very strong sure. play, in which case the risk it for the biscuit play there doesn't really do anything, right? Like, right. you roll up, you try to wombo combo, they just use their dice to stop it, and then you leave. And it's like... Okay. No, I mean, like, I think about them rolling up on, like, the the Stormcast double Encantor, right? It, that Encantor's gonna be like, nah, dog. Sure, like, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, exactly. You're not, you're not teleporting. Like, that's not... We're not playing that game here, right? Like, just shut um, off the and... teleport or shut off. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't. I don't counter the tutor. I counter this. I counter the thing they tutor for. Make them waste multiple resources. But sure, right? Yeah, right. Like they can have the teleport. They just don't get this anything at the end of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. they they spend a lot of time making a rat go from here to here and then back to here. Like, I don't know. Good job. 
I mean, sec secondary consequences, again, I know this is exactly what you're going for, but in my mind, there's an obvious potential problem with, I mean, this isn't saying anything uh, crazy, the war song Revenant. I've already seen it in a season of War Battle Report, where if, you know, it can pop off in a huge way, potentially. I think Jordan had a 22, 26 hitting multiple units. Every five up is a mortal wound. I mean, that doesn't seem great for the game. Uh, so, like, anything that can potentially go off, and I mean, to me, it's like a... The trog bomb right now that's obviously hopefully going to get addressed tomorrow whenever we see the battle scroll. There is a relatively small number of things like that that just it's the potential for for it such an extreme. Not that it will always happen, but it just seems like a terrible reality to live in that you can have such an extreme potential be on the board in the first place as sure. a sure as yeah, a possibility. Yeah. So there, like Scragrot's probably another one in terms of what he could do with primal Isn't dice. Is it the unmodified casting rule? Oh, that's. I guess yeah. Actually, if you if you make, oh uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's right. I'd have to double check if he is. But I don't think the War Song Revenant is right now. So even if it's rolled as a as a modifier, I think it would still go off right now on the War Song Revenant's bomb. I haven't played so enough in forever. You know, somebody who plays so enough can double check that. But but yeah, uh, Martin Marty just mentioned Lore Seeker, great delivery vehicle for Blizzard, teleporting three away and cast on three d six plus two. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, but again, like, at the end of the day, 3d6 plus 2, against a lot of armies, they're just going to say no to that. Yeah. Sure. But, like, and, so, and again, that, yeah. how this is going to be part of the swing. People are going to push into this, like, let me try to, to this is this is the secondary and tertiary consequences, right? This is exactly yeah, what I'm trying right. to map out. Because, like, yeah. okay, so people push hard into, like, can I... We'll, we'll talk about the spells in a minute, but can I do a big mortal wound bomb? Right? right. Can I teleport up and do a big mortal wound bomb? And then as anti-magic rises and these two, this, this irresistible force meets this immovable object, what, who surrenders? Right. <laughs> I, yeah. Right. Vince, I think we're all three aligned around. This is very likely to be the overall outcome. I, I've already noticed it in my list building and like in thinking through some list, it's like, when you get into battalions, like with the end, we'll go into battalions, but it's like it suddenly creates some interesting things in terms of drop count and number of heroes that you need to have. Like if you want to go acolytes and warlord to get the extra enhancement, well, now you're suddenly at five heroes and that potentially imbalances your list in a number of armies. You don't have enough troops. Uh, and then, but yeah, it's just, it, it's felt off when I've leaned too far into magic in a yeah. number of my lists so far because sure. of the, the expectation of a certain level of anti-magic in response to... Sure. The obvious play. Well, and that's where stuff that where you can just like ignore spells on an X or whatever, whatever, or cause penalties to cast or, 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 or where like you don't have to use an active resource to do it becomes highly more valuable, right? That's what separates the anti spell doms from the like, from the, the, the great ones from the, the average ones, right? When right. you can have stuff that's just like there and functioning as opposed to you needing to blow the resource of an auto unbind. Like the auto unbind will stop the, the mortal wounds bomb. But it doesn't right. stop the other eight spells they wanted to get off, right? But if you have like multiple things making them do or hurt their casting in some way, then okay, yeah. now you're you're just effectively penalizing them all over the place, and they're failing left and right, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, Drew Bishop Sai says Alario can use primal dice too, which I hope we address the god units that are non Andes shouldn't get to use primal dice. Thoughts? I mean, anybody can. It's not it's not a caster. It's yeah. the player doing it. Like anybody could, any spell cast or unbind or dispel can use primal dice. It has nothing to do with the caster you choose. It is a player attempting it, and they can they the player chooses to use the stuff. So, yeah, I mean, there you go. Injury. <laughs> I tested primal dice with the war song the other day. Dealt fifty seven mortal wounds in the casting phase in a single turn. Yeah, that seems probably a little bit off. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, I, as... I like my money would be something like that gets addressed. I mean, sure. I, yeah. So, like, I don't think they're going to just let a thing like that float around. So, <laughs> right. One would hope not. They generally right. get pretty good at finding these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, okay. I want to pause here before we go to the next section and start talking about the details to just mm -hmm. make this following point. Man, this is the best narrative uh, book I've read in a long time. And then, mm -hmm. like, I want to do the joke where I, like, somebody comes and whispers in my ear, and I'm like, what's that? This is the normal <laughs> event book? Oh, that seems weird. Okay. Because, like, 
these feel like what we should be doing for the next season of war whatever mm-hmm. yeah like weird narrative like battle packs yeah like this feels so much heavier than what i need yeah. for a season of warhammer to play at events or or in the general's handbook or whatever right like mm. your general matched play battle pack we've got to screw with the base rules of the game this much like i don't know man <laughs> like it it i i appreciate like if you rocked up and told me this was the cool narrative thing you could do where you played in the wizard place and did the and did wizard stuff i'd be like yeah okay great cool i'm i'm good with it what what an awesome and unique interesting uh narrative battle pack i just have no clue what all this stuff is doing in a in a in the matched play standardized battle pack do we need this level of change year to year is this like the appropriate amount to swing the base game around i mean tyler uh, it go ahead tom go go, do it, tom. go tom yeah yeah, I mean, what I would say is this: like, it's it's way heavier than we, um, and we've talked about this because what this is doing is this is truly remaking, reshaping the landscape on a yearly basis for winners and losers, more so than points ever did, you know. And we had this conversation, you know, a year ago, six months ago, about just how heavy these these um, these battle packs were to the point of almost being unfun. Just because they completely completely invalidate play styles, they completely invalidate certain armies, or they marginalize them heavily, um, and so it's just it's such a big swing for um, for for a season where people are trying to you know if they're trying to get armies up to you know top tier painted or whatever, it's real hard to do that in the six, you know the six to twelve even twelve months when some of these armies are going to be non standard builds. They're not you know this isn't meat and potatoes that we're talking about here, right? Like you were talking about ally and in all this crazy crap to stick with the thing. I'm like, is that is that how we want the base game to play? That like fire slayers to compete now just automatically have two stormcast wizards following around? Like, is that the right level of change in the game? That feels weird to me. Uh, yeah, right. I think right. that's fair. Yeah. What what's an a pro- what do you guys want? Is is there an elevator version of what you guys want? And and you've probably said in the past, but in relation to this, okay, so you don't want this. What do you want? Some really interesting battle tactics, battle plans, and grand strategies. The core thing. And then some realm rules. Sure, if you want to like, if you want to stick in the seasons and we're exploring the realms as part of the GHB, do that throughout mm. the General's Handbook. Like the General's Handbook, can we return back to having things for like lots of different types of play? I'm not going to use their modes of play thing, but like put in a whole narrative thing in there that's like, here's some stuff to further explore the current season. And then in the match play thing, it's like, okay, um, wizards get plus one to cast. And here's a magic item that can auto unbind a spell once a game, like a new realm artifact that does that. Once a game, you can auto unbind a thing. And Mm -hmm. wizards have a six up ward. Okay, cool. Magic season. Got it. Like that feels like a pretty light touch to me. Mm. Yeah, they need to. It's the difference between like thick and thin. Like they need a much thinner rule set for match play because it needs to have some degree of continuity between seasons. Yeah, like we're wildly swinging here. What? What? Like, like there are armies that will that will like sort of your base percentage to rock up to the table and how effective that army is. That you will need to make massive changes to your army from like pre this GHB to now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and there are armies that like this won't impact at all. They're going to keep doing the same strategy. They're just going to keep doing the same thing. They were. They'll just now be like way better at it, right? And that's like yeah. when, I, when I say like rebuild your your list. I mean like a lot. I don't know. I, well, we should. Yeah, let's let's do another show where we look at that. I mean, I, when we get more information and let's see what lists are looking like. I would bet that we're not going to see. Well, I, I I think you could build a lot of lists without that significant of change. In some ways, the loss of Galatian veterans in my mind might have more impact in certain factions than this stuff. You know, where like now you're not going to see as many Volkite Berserkers potentially, or uh, Blade Geist Revenants, you know, are going to not be able to be in big units because Galivets is gone. And things like that I could see being more impactful. Maybe. But the... 
loss of Galatian champions is going to be impactful with now being able to snipe better or more back on the table. The I, I mean, I hear what you guys are saying. Yeah, I mean, it gets in the whole argument about six months, 12 months. I, there are so many players who play this game competitively who get bored after after six months. And uh, I, I'm hearing actually quite a bit of excitement, at least personally out there, about this level of change and zaniness and craziness like oh this is this is the aos that i remember from like earlier on like yeah let's do this this is this is really interesting it's a different very different casting so I, i'm certainly hearing some other viewpoints out there on all of this but I, it could I be hey it. look tell me in the like right now hey chat you're out there voice your opinion have it be heard like is this yeah. do you want to see this amount of change more than this amount of change or less than this amount of change like let's just do a you know about right more or less uh season to season in the ghp right like, like sure i'm 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 curious like i'm not i am in no way that's why i've sort of phrased it as a question at the beginning right because mm. i don't i don't know that my opinion is representative of the 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 people on this i don't know that i'm speaking for the proletariat right i'm, mm -hmm. I'm speaking my opinion and that's what i'm honestly asking like is this the correct stuff um mm -hmm. so like i i don't know now like i said it's funny, I, I keep talking about this, because there's actually a lot of stuff in this season that I do quite like, which we will get to. It's just I feel yeah. like this base rule stuff is so heavy. Like, there's FAQ questions and, like, everything with these primal magic and rolling all this stuff. is like, oh, boy, this is a lot of stuff going on, right? Do you think this is a net improvement on the prior on the casting system of AWS? I know you've always had issues with the casting system. Okay, it was. Is this a net improvement? Is this a wash? Is it worse? It's it's worse. It's just exacerbating an existing problem. Uh, Tom, do you feel that way? Yeah, I think so. I, okay, interesting. I mean, I I don't know. My my first thing that, again. I mean, if we went through the design process, if you guys were doing it, and then I mean, I'm sure it could be better. But I find this to be more intriguing personally as a base, as like as the casting system, casting as as a spell, the magic system we're going to have for the next year. I find this to be a lot more compelling. Including Did, because it takes, yeah. Let me let me ask you a question, Tyler. Yeah. Did we need a subsystem for a subsystem? Oh, I mean, again, from we can make a first principles argument. I'm gonna have a hard time. Yeah. Okay. So if you're, yeah, probably not. Like I said, there's probably a better way to design this than this. I mean, you you. But we're kind of arguing. Okay, if you would start at the drawing board and do it all over again. I'm more just saying, uh, like, I'm not really having a first principles conversation where this is the reality. Is this reality no. better? Yeah. Yeah, like I hear that. But but I think that even like, yes, first principles, but even deeper than that, mm. um, one of the things that Vince had highlighted, I think that I do want to put a pin on is that this just doesn't touch everybody. So to make something the hallmark of the season. I think that's fair. Yeah. For army, some armies that it's just not a thing for them. Yeah. Really? Like there are armies that just don't have meaningful unbinds. So right. like, they're just not they're Like that's yeah. Yeah. They're that, not that's even... where his, that's what he was getting at with his richer, the rich are going to get richer, poor, poor. That was the nuance. I, I I think I agree with that. Unfortunately, that that is definitely yeah. one of the downsides of this. That it's just like it's we're in a new season, and some people are like we are, right? Yeah. Because they don't like it. Like there, nothing changes about any of their play style or abilities. That um, and that's the problem when you design a subsystem for a subsystem, is that it's not going to touch everybody. Yeah. So just glancing yeah, over the comments that, that that sort of flowed in, I didn't see a single vote for more. So if this is like what what the comments everybody but everybody who who voiced their opinion, uh, obviously a limited sample set and and you know like whatever whatever, but everybody said either this is correct for the twelve month season and I like this amount if it's going to last a whole year, right? Yeah. Or I want less than this to you know a lot less something like that, right? So what we've I mean just from that very limited thing and I would tend to agree if anything this is kissing the upper limit of like. We are at the asymptote of change here, right? This mm -hmm. is as heavy as it could possibly be. I, I think that is for sure. Uh, right on. Well, so. yeah, I mean, you obviously know where I stand on the whole complexity, simplicity discussion we've been having for the past two years now. 
that <laughs> we need to be going in the opposite direction of where we've been for quite some time. So sure. at the end of the day, first principles, like I'm, I'm obviously in aligned with that. And uh, Polcastro, your opinions are irrelevant for less than night because you think the truck bomb is fine. So yeah, just, yeah, man, just don't, don't even post, buddy. I mean, I'll ask it. Anthony's, I'll answer Anthony's question, which is a resounding no. I cannot picture being like trying to explain this to, no. to a new person. Yeah. <laughs> this is like opaque as, right? That's wild. This is wild. Okay, right. so here's how magic works. Sorry, do you remember, did you learn all that? Okay, cool. Now there's this other thing. Here's a homework <laughs> assignment. Read about primal magic dice. Like, oh my God. Like, sure. get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. All right, cool. So now let's move on to the other sort of supplementary elements to this. So we start with it, which I actually like how they designed a lot of these things. Um, like here, here we get into stuff I'm actually quite positive on, which is, so unique enhancements can only be taken in an army that does not include any wizards or any units with abilities that would allow a unit to cast spells in the same manner as a wizard. This kind of stuff I like. Good. Good. Neat. Nice that you can't give it to the wizard people and have them do play both sides of the the, the aisle there. I'm I'm for that. So, uh, yeah, here's your, here, here's your well being program, Vince, or, yeah. or what we call the welfare the welfare programs. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes. In, in this in this country. Okay. All right. So how how good we, did we do on these benefits? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so the hand carved nullstone icon. Bad. Cool. Neat. Um, yeah. Uh, we just talked about how people are going to be casting and the amount of spell doms. And you're like, yeah, boy, let me get in there with that raw 2d6. I'm going to get that One. spell. No, you're not. You ain't unbinding anything. Well, uh, you know, anecdotal, so I'll, I'll be quiet. But that, it's certainly not been my experience so far in running this. Sure. Sometimes. Again, again that, that mini game, that mini game of where you are not. You're, you're not yeah, taking ahead. any wizards to get this. Right, so you're gonna right. have this unbind and your heroic discipline or heroic willpower, or whatever it's called, the thingy that lets you unbind. Right, that's what right. you're gonna have. Plus, yeah, potentially, right. like if you're clever and you have priests that can unbind or corn dogs or whatever. Right, sure. Yeah. But like, I'm taking an item as opposed to anything else to get one more two d six roll. Right now, I do get primal dice on this. You're absolutely right. I I could choose to use primal dice on this. Right, but no, right. I'm just like, there's no way, man. With like. Because I've got the, I can also use a primal dice on my heroic willpower, and I'm not going to have that many primal dice on average. Sure. Yeah, because you're not taking. Yeah, the problem here is you're not getting access to the acolytes battalion, and I think that's going to be quite prevalent. Right. As a way of getting, yeah, different, yeah, difference. And I mean, stonks on heroic willpower have shot through the roof. Let me say that. <laughs> sure. As a heroic action. Ah, uh, okay. This is fun. Uh, I'm being very disagreeable tonight. This is great. Yeah, it's it's good, like good all stuff. of these episodes, you just hang back, Tom, and I just let this guy run roughshod mm -hmm. over me with all no. of his strong opinions. No, <laughs> I uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you know uh, backbone, Tyler. It's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's um, right. Okay. Uh, the pouch of null dust. Uh. Once per battle, at the start of the hero phase, you can say the bearer will use their pouch of null dust. If you do so until the end of that phase, unmodified casting rolls that include a double one, double two, or double three are treated as miscasts, or if primal di magic dice was rolled on part of the casting roll as primal miscasts, um, roll a dice for each endless spell on the battlefield on a five plus that endless spell is dispelled. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It actually doesn't do that much mathematically because it's not like... It's only adding double twos and double threes to the list. Um, but it is interesting against somebody like Zinch who, who will who will sometimes very easily achieve double threes and then still cast their spells on a seven, <laughs> right, right, or something. That becomes right. very funny. Um, like them rolling, say, a three and a one or something on, on 2d6 is like not that uncommon of an event. So turning that into a miscast is, is a price, especially, uh, or, or uh, is a pretty funny thing. Does this force all Lords of Change to miscast? Uh, no, because they roll a four, mm. they just immediately yeah. like pull themselves out of it, right? It's it's like it's only if they happen to only have oh. like three, yeah. ones, like, twos, and threes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, mathematically, this doesn't do that much, right? What it 
does do, though, is clearly or meaningfully disincentivize using primal dice whenever this is up, in my mind. So you... Yeah, yeah well, that I like, agree with. 100%. Yeah, this is that's actually why this one's interesting to me, because yeah. of the soft incentive against using the, the primal magic dice. Because right. if your casting role included, like, your... Like, I, because I have to say this at the start of the hero phase, right? So, Tyler, it's the start of your hero phase, right? Yeah. You're, and you're like playing a Zinch army, and you're about to, you, I know you've got like 10 or 12 spell casts. Yeah. Right. It, like, me blowing this on a turn when I don't want you really, want, don't really want you using magic, suddenly, like, is a huge disincentive to you actually using any PMD during that phase. Because right. if your regular casting roll, again, now we'll take the Lord of Change out of it, and somebody who's not manipulating the dice in some way, people who are just rolling maybe even with big bonuses, right? Plus four yeah. cast, who gives a crap, right? Um, if your dice roll contained any ones, twos, or threes, suddenly right. adding more primal magic dice to the mix does meaningfully change your, your the, the incentive to click that, to, to, to punch that, that whopper button. Right? Yep. Because you radically increase your chance of primal miscasting. So, I, I, and that was my experience. And again, it's I, I, I'll stop qualifying it, right? I understand it. it's one game, it's anecdotal, etc. Okay, yeah, yeah. but trying out Nullstone Adornments for S and Giggles, I had Patch of Null, Null, Null Dust and the hand carved Nullstone Icon, and uh, a extra. Let's see, no, because I had no wizards. Yeah, so I just had two unbinds in that game, uh, Heroic Willpower and the built-in one. Yes, okay. So yeah, just what I was finding with that disincentive, at least when it went off, it did al allow some bump, meaningful bump and benefit with the Null Stone icon where I'm using Primal Dice and they're not. Yeah, it helped yeah. me then get multiple multiple taps, right, of the yep. Null Stone icon. Absolutely. So it, it's it's too it's probably too limited, but it was some some meaningful benefit with, with yeah, with those conditions. Like, like in general, I I don't think these go far enough as a as a well-being package, as a, as an equity sure. package. Sure. Uh, the yeah. yeah, they don't go far enough, but they're they're not terrible. Yeah, I actually like this one the most solely because I like the 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 I like the way it screws with the incentives around primal magic dice. It basically yeah. makes it so, um, you know, you can you do have pretty strong control of the of the magic phase in a really interesting and in an orthodox way um, because it strongly disincentivizes them using the dice unless their base roll already has like no ones twos or threes in it right they, they roll like a four right. or five like okay in which case they were going to get the stupid spell off anyways because they're now they're just like they're they're probably tripping off into super cast territory right, right. so yeah um that's actually my favorite one from the list because of that. Mm. Uh, by the way, this is another thing that can also just like incidentally dispel all the spells. <laughs> just talking about like and the spells sure. going away really easily. I mean, that's not the yeah. benefit of it. It's on a five up, but it still just like can incidentally blah 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 just kill an endless spell and it's like okay cool. Yeah. Uh, and then the pebble. When this unit is picked as a target of a spell or abilities of an endless spell, you can roll a die on a four plus. The caster must pick another unit within three inches of this unit, within range of that spell around the spell's abilities to be the target. If when picking another unit, there are no other units within three inches of this unit and within range, ignore the effect of that spell or the effects of that endless spell's abilities on this unit instead. Okay. I'd like it better if it was just a four-up spell ignore rather than shifting yeah. the blame. But yeah. it's fine. Um, all right, so yeah, you just have to keep you gotta keep that person units, more than more than three away. Yeah. 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 yeah I was. I mean, thinking of the big pieces, you know, Frostlord on Stonehorn, sure. Ma Crusher, etc. I, I know Ma Crusher has Weirden, uh, but I mean, you could double up on Weirden and sure. this. I think that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, or Fasten in this, and yeah. So I, yeah, this one's interesting. If with, with certain pieces that could potentially really benefit from this. Agreed. I, I agree. I don't. I do not. I do not dislike this one. I'm actually two out of three on this list. Like the hand carved Nullstone icon, I just don't believe in. But I, I like the first, I like the other two. I know yeah. that runs counter to your experiences, but I like the other two. Tom, sure. where are you? Where are you but, yeah. Um. It's it's terrible. Hmm. <laughs> like. So let I mean, me a get four this. Four spell ignores. Not bad. 
You just have to not stand within three inches of anybody. Okay. Right. Um. Yeah, I just I'm not. And you have to build to not have a wizard in the army, and you have to use an enhancement, sure. and and like it just it's oh, it is Tom, not. Um, you get this for free. If if you want an extra one, you have I to. I know. You yeah, have to no. use and Yeah. Really, the, the the trip into this is don't have any wizards. Don't yeah. have any wizards. Yeah, I know. I know. I just it's a lot. It's a lot. It's great for corn. Corn loves it. Yeah, I mean, um, corn's still sneaking wizards into their list a bunch. Probably, I've seen a bunch of initial people throwing like sneaking wizards in because that's still not a prohibition. There's still wizards you can sneak into that list. Stop of course them! They are. Stop them! Stop them now! Uh, mm -hmm. Let's yeah. let's 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 shut that there down. There should everybody. just be a thing that says like nobody's <laughs> allowed to cast a spell here. Stop it! Stop what are you um, doing? Yep. You're doing your life. As an aside, at this rate on the uh, our progress for our slides, we'll have a ten hour show tonight. Oh, we're gonna be love fine. It. Don't worry, we're spending a lot of time. Here. We'll, we'll get through it. Uh, it's a lot of good discussion. Um, the, uh, yes, as Kyle Nelson points out, they are compelled to pick their own units if your unit is only within three of their units, which is fine. Like, it will, it will go to their, their unit. If it's like a big damaging spell. Which is cool. It's fun. I mean, it means, it means you just won't get targeted by the spell. Like, no one's... No one's throwing a Horfrost at you on the 50-50 to wreck their own unit, right? Like, that's just not going to happen. But then, yeah. if that's the case, it's a 100% spell ignore, so still successful. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Brendan makes a good point, which I don't think we mentioned yet. It's a unique enhancement, but it's an artifact. Well, I don't think... Anyway, the point being, you cannot take an artifact and a Nullstone enhancement, a Nullstone endorment, on the same hero. Correct. If you have an artifact... If they have an artifact, you cannot take a null stone. Yeah. So yeah, good point. All right, spells. Let's talk about it. We've been these are these are some big ones. These are some big ones. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, so first off, or sorry, I said hoarfrost. I meant merciless blizzard. I apologize. Um, so first off, hoarfrost. All right. Look, here's what I I almost feel compelled to read this whole spell. This is a wild mm -hmm. spell. Okay. Casting value 8, range of 12 inches. If successfully cast, pick one friendly unit wholly within range, invisible to the caster. I just mistyped all over here. Tyler, where was your editing? I blame you. No, it's fine. Invisible to the caster. Oh. Pick one melee weapon profile on that unit's war scroll and roll a d3. Oh, whoops. Change <laughs> the two hit, two wound, or rend characteristic of that melee weapon to match the result until the start of your next hero phase. So if you roll a 2, you get to set the thing to a 2+, plus or rend 2, or whatever. Uh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Good stuff. Now, the relevant part here is you don't have to choose the characteristic until after you've rolled the dice. Yep. You have to choose the weapon first, but you don't right. have to choose the characteristic. Okay? Yep. So we saw this spoiled a little while back. This is one of the most powerful buff spells ever printed, if not the most powerful buff spell ever printed. I don't categorically remember every buff spell ever printed, but it's up mm -hmm. there. It would be in, it's a Hall of Famer instantaneously. Um, Hall of Famer in its rookie year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The casting value of eight just doesn't matter. Um, <sighs> like, because again, this is sure. why I say this is going to get done to you. Like, the spell dummy people who are thrilled to take this. Oh, I should state these uh, spells can only be taken by Andorian. Locuses, yeah. and this replaces the other spell that they they would know, like they choose this instead of a different spell. So only Andy's can take this. this these are these mm -hmm. spells are Andy only. Uh, and this can obviously be hugely impactful when put on units that are normally say making a ton of attacks, but hitting on like a four up or a five up, right? Mm -hmm. um, say like your Cabalists, and you're casting on three d six. And you've got some Chaos Knights who, who annoyingly always hit on fours. <laughs> sure. Now suddenly they hit on ones or twos. Yeah. That's going to be very impactful to the overall performance of those Chaos Knights. Right? Right. And so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, big horde units, lots of attacks, you know, grots or squigs. Yeah, sure. Right. There's like, squigs so many who examples. hit on fours. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Like... But again, unless you have somebody who can power this through, it's going to rarely happen. 
if you have somebody mm -hmm. with a large bonus to cast, right, who can like generate high numbers, if you are a spell dom, this is a hugely impactful thing for your army. So looking at the overlap between like who's spell doming and then who has units that are going to benefit the most from this, that's where your your power lies with Horfrost, right? Again, unless you're um, in a middle class versus middle class game, and then you're just like, we both got plus one to cast an unbind. Let's do it, guys. Then like, cool, <laughs> you, just, you know, swing for the fences. Somebody hits Horfrost off and just wrecks somebody because they go to Ren three. Yeah. Right. Like instant. Like what? A, what a great day. Uh, real quick shout out to Warhammer underscore Rob on Twitter. Warhammer Rob, he had a great thread of different Horfrost combos. So if you're if you're interested in getting ideas for what you can do with this thing, check out that thread on Twitter. Yes, and oh. Keith Rogers says, "Was your awesome hammer unit made balanced by having a bad hit to a bad to hit, a bad to wound, or a bad rend?" Don't worry, I've got the spell for you. Yeah, I mean. Uh, and then Romulan said 30 Storm Vermin at Rend 3. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I'll also take 30 Storm Vermin hitting on 2s or whatever. That would also be fine. Um, I'll take it. The And, like, they actually have the Grace here to power it through. Keith, or, mm -hmm. or, sorry, Mike says Ghouls with Rend 3. Mike, put that idea out of your head. Who's who's casting in your army? No one. FEC doesn't have spellcasters. Not any to speak of that matter in this season. So unless you're going to go get in a fight with another middleweight, ain't that, that spell ain't happening. You fight Iron Jaws, you get rend three. You fight, like, most people, you don't get rend. That's that's how it works. That spell only works against other middleweights if you're in that army. This is well, why I'm saying but, it will be done to you. So who can push these spells out? Is it your spell dom None of your spell doms can push these spells out. Sure they can. The Slon. The Grey Seer, like, like Skaven could accumulate quite a few bonuses uh, to cast and roll on 3d6. Uh, but, uh, and, and... but what I'm saying is, is a lot of your standard, like, high bonus, reliable casters are unique. Many of them. Sure. I mean, Aslan's not, and he's at, what, base plus two, plus three, depending on how you build the army? Sure. Sure. And he has sure. unlimited I mean, that, saying... range and, and, and. There are a handful. But but the reality is is that most of the, most of your actual spell bombs that are really throwing around spell power are not going to be pushing these spells out. I agree, I agree. I think what that's why I said most of the time what's going to happen is you're going to be an average caster trying to put this spell out and then having and like if you get lucky enough it just gets shut off, right? Yeah, it just gets spiked. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Tyler, did we miss anything on Horfrost? Uh, CW mentioned Haywa's tweet uh, in response to that thread. I mentioned the best combo I've found so far is successfully casting it on one of your units. Uh, that was Haywa's beautiful tweet in response to all this. So that's that's aligned with some of what we've been sure. expressing here. <laughs> sure. Yes, Branu, every single non-unique hero in Kabbalist, also an excellent, yeah, also an excellent uh, shout out. Yeah. Let's see, let's see that S2D win rate come back up. I have a, I have a sense that people are going to suddenly, at least at the beginning of the season, we're going to suddenly see the sub-faction stats like go whoop <laughs> and jump <laughs> way up on one sub-faction. Just yeah. a general feeling I have for no reason. Um, <laughs> ruptures crap. I don't care. Next. Uh, Tyler, would you like to defend <clears throat> Rupture? Do we have a disagreement here? The second spell? Oh, to, to what degree people will lean in, will see more of the Caleb Walters TM zine strategy of uh, making your incarnate wild as soon as possible and then having endless spells. But like we were saying, if you're going to have endless spells being dispelled more often where they're not able to be eaten, then maybe that's going to be less likely uh, to have to happen with, with incarnates you know, going wild. So I, I doubt it's going to be a huge issue, but that in general, anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, if a if an incarnate is able to eat an endless spell regularly, it's almost impossible to kill, basically. Sure. And and so it just, it may not kill a whole lot itself, but it, it goes and tries to tie up as much of your army as possible and being an absolute pain in the ass. That's what Caleb did. That's what we saw some other people doing in Siege for a while, right? So to what degree could we see that generalized in the game? I don't expect it to happen, but it's a possibility and this spell can contribute. To be clear, you're saying the actual use of this spell is not at all what it's clearly been printed to no. try to do. <laughs> no. Right. Right. That's all pointless because it's a sideboard card. 
right? Yeah. Like, you can get this gloom out of my main deck, thank you. Okay. <laughs> but if you're... The only time you play this, you main deck this, is when you're trying to, like, destroy your own stuff. You want to turn yes. your own things wild, you want to run your own incarnate wild, like, whatever. All this wacky crap you're trying to accomplish, right? Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I agree. Which, the, the, we are a simple fact away. I would love to see it. We should have seen it a long time ago to fix this. Because it's rather, sorry, Caleb, it's rather silly. Uh, he'd probably admit it's rather silly. Uh, but, we're, yeah, we, we're still enjoying this in the game, so. Sure. There we um, are. Yes, I like, Rupture's there. I, I like, you'd have to, I can't imagine that the, given everything else we've talked about that's set against endless spells, and the fact that we haven't gotten a second incarnate, and the fact that we're going to talk about battle tactics in a moment, which, which are battle tactics, which make incarnates also uh, risky. Uh mm. I like I do not see the world that evolves where people are main decking rupture. I just don't. Now, yeah. the reality is we're about to talk about a command trait that maybe you get all three of these, right? You're sure. you're you're taking the command trait to get Horfrost and Merciless Blizzard, right? And then you accidentally got rupture. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then Merciless Blizzard, casting value of twelve and a range of twelve. Big number, most of the time, not here. Mm. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range invisible. That unit suffers 4d6 mortal wounds. For each roll of a one, who cares? You just did 4d6 <laughs> mortal wounds. Shut up. Stop <laughs> complaining. Mm. I would do this every time. Uh, yeah. And the range of the spell can never be modified in any way. Blah, 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 blah. So, okay, cool. No... No, uh, no Archon, no Spell Portal, no yada yada. Right. Right. It's 12 inches. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of Mortal Wounds. I'm very glad to see this spell. There's a spell, a spell like this should have always existed, by the way. Mm. Not just in this season. I'm a firm believer this should have always existed. If Magic's going to be a wildly swingy system, then, uh, let's lean into it. Let's put some Redonk casting value crap in there and uh let people swing for the fences i'm not sure i love it in a season where 12 suddenly actually becomes a relatively achievable number regularly but uh yeah. you know i think i think magic should sometimes have some real swingy weird effects so i'm good with it and you know as you said people will try to spell bomb this right they'll try to yeah. teleport mm -hmm. people forward and alpha strike with merciless lizard and um yeah they'll uh, the command yeah. trait we're about to talk about they'll take the command trait where they get access to all these spells and they could do an endless spell on top if they're going second right like yeah hero phrase teleport you're going second with just one caster now you got two cast but now you're doing merciless blizzard and an endless spell and some of these new endless spells are, are pretty meaningful in the damage output like yeah yep so uh okay let's um let's keep going uh, yeah, so Merciless Blizzard, fun stuff. Command Traits, you can choose one if the General is an Andy. Uh, Shaman of the Chilllands, as you know, all the those three spells. Cool. Um, Eye of the Blizzard is at the start of your hero phase on a 5-up. You get an extra Primal Magic dice. That can that can tip the inequity if you, if you really want to go that strat, which is interesting, actually. Uh, Chill to the Bone, uh, you can... Uh, that's just on a 34. On a 3 plus. That's very funny. Uh, on a 3 plus, you can ignore the effects of that. Nope. Never throw good money after bad. Roll hard. Like, that's a that's a, that's a Tyler command trait. Okay. Which one? Chill to the, the Blizzard? No, Chill to the bone. the bone. That's a Tyler command trait. Tyler's over here good. trying to hedge off against weaknesses and stuff. <laughs> trying to close off the risk. No. Bet big to win big, baby. Yeah. Good you have to step up your bad. game, your your game, Tom. I'm I'm out Johnnying you apparently in this moment. Uh, step it up, buddy. And then Eater of Magic. Each time you successfully unbind a spell on a five up, the caster no longer knows that spell and may not cast it. Now we're talking. Yeah. I now mean, we're I, having fun. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a crazy. <laughs> I love one. this. This oh, is more. So this is more for my money on the anti magic side. Because actually, yeah. like you joke, I don't know if you're joking or serious, but I actually think that's really strong. No, I generally think, yeah, I think it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, there there'll be a certain class competitive players that will decide the calculus on this is not in their favor. But I was three for three the first time trying this out, so it's apparently it's amazing. 
we have talked about all of the incentive into mm. running anti-magic, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And all of the ways that primal magic dice should just be used to unbind spells. And you have argued you will be actually able to unbind a lot more spells because of whatever, whatever, depending on the situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if everything you and I have said in this show, all three of us have said in this show is yeah. true, then Eater of Magic is actually really good because you're going to be unbinding more. And if every yeah. round you pick off one of their spells, one to two of their spells, that's actually right. yeah. crazy impactful on the game in shutting yeah. off a magic strat. This is yet another reason why I think the anti-magic strategy is really strong. Yeah, you have, like in my mind, look, I look at this command trade list. So I've just been building Stormcast so far, uh, not, not looking at anything else. But Stormcast, historically, not a lot of options. So Master Magic was often a go-to. Uh, le less so now. Or certainly there are competitive options here. Sh Shaman of the Chilled Lands is one. Eater Magic is two. These embody, in my mind, what you're saying, right? Do, do you think Shaman of the Chill Lands is the one to lean into with the expectation of casting those spells or the anti-magic? Is it, is it pro-magic or anti-magic, right? It's either that's embodied 100%. In this. Feels so and that's, 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 where I, that's where I came down with all of this. And in terms of like a balanced list, I'm not leaning too hard because Corn is out there, No Mirrored is out there. Like building a toolbox list, a balanced list, which as we get into the battle plans at 2 a.m., uh, we'll see that, you know, they, I think they really incentivize having balanced lists, having mobility, etc. So, yeah, I'm a, I think it's really interesting. I mean, again, a salon with Eater of Magic. Crazy wild. You, you set yourself up to be going second, uh, you know, in every yeah. round, you, where you're getting, where you're getting extra unbinds. Fantastic. Let's say you're already a double caster, now you're triple unbinding. You're getting three bites right. of this potential apple every round. This is nothing but money. Right. Right, killing their ability to Mystic Shield for the rest of the game, depending on how many casters they have. Crazy strong. <laughs> Poor LRL with to total eclipse. Yeah, I mean, I would just like to shut mm. off Power of Haish. Like that unit can't cast it anymore. Suck it, suck it, Sentinels. I hope you took the guy on the antelope, or whatever. Number of people are pointing out the salon. Yeah, obviously huge stonks in the salon, yeah. uh, seemingly this 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 season, uh, with with this. Although you really are taking a hit. I mean, they're, they're obviously I can't remember the name of it, but the one that gives you extra cosmic power points. Sure. Um, something sure. special. Uh, the, yeah. That, I, that's I don't think the. Answer. Yeah, I mean, my honest answer is I don't think the the. I've never. I've always fully believed that the 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 mortal wound bomb thing is is going to get corrected or be overrated in some way. This feels like a more balanced. Please. That just plays you better. <laughs> yeah. So. Please get corrected. It's insane yeah. right now. Yes. Uh, all right. Cool. All right. Core battalions. Uh, these are new core battalion options. They're capped at one each per list. You've got and and you got Andy acolytes, two small foot heroes, yep. one optional mm -hmm. foot hero. Start of the hero phase. If there are two or more friendly Andy locust units in this battalion on the battlefield, roll a die. On a three plus, you gain one primal magic die. So cool. And then wizard finders of Andor, you get some bonus attacks against wizards. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Let me, let me, so now here's where I've had this argument in the bag. Cause you've mentioned this taking the acolytes like a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm harder on bat reg than I've ever been. I want to be one mm. drop. I want to be hard core one drop. Okay. You need to determine who's going second. Correct. Yeah. I'm going to touch that pin uh, up sure. in the corner. Yeah. Which is the power of going second in this season is so massive. And we haven't yeah. even talked about all of it yet. Okay. That I want to be one drop and set myself up to make that decision as often as humanly possible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's okay. just not worth a three up primal magic die to me. No freaking way. No freaking way. Two cracks at three up. We uh, yeah so yeah for armies that really care about it I can see that there are still a number of armies I think that don't care about drops or sure. that they have other reasons to be more than oh, one drop right my that's I take warlord and acolytes I take the anti acolytes because yeah. sure why not let's go let's go nuts man I'm like yeah. fifteen drops already who cares yeah I haven't thought about I just I'm so tired of battle reg in this game like just nuke it 
Ugh, I, I can't stand it. The I, so yeah, I haven't thought a whole lot about that, and yeah, but you you could be right. I don't know. What do you think, Tom? You, you think, does that add up in your mind? Probably still yeah, for those who can I do mean, it are still leaning into it. I think it polarizes. It it pushes us back. So like I think about this in relationships like bounty hunters, right? Yeah. Bounty hunters was such a strong incentive to go multi drop. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this this just isn't. You get all your toys and you can still be one drop, which gives you better decisions on your toys. Right? Mm. What do you mean? Like, because you get Prime Lodge, if you get to play in all those pools, the really powerful stuff, without without having to give up one drops. And so I think that in general, this will become the purview of those that just, that one drops aren't an option. I don't, like yeah, this will be yeah. this will become the default extra. This will not be something that people g g like build for. Yeah, if you're a lot of drops, you take this. If uh, you can be one drop, you you are. That would be yeah. a very interesting analysis. That, I mean, we'll 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 see with Liz, but it would be very interesting to actually try to go through that analysis in terms of, of predictive expectations, uh, because that could potentially further lean into the anti magic case this season. In the end, um, in, you know, where where right you have that differential of maybe. Uh, maybe Lumineth or Zinch or some of those armies that are magic oriented that are going one drop, but then they're not getting the benefit of the primal dice, two cracks at it per battle round, three up to in particular lean into the anti magic even more against them. Something like that. I don't know. I'd be curious. Sure. But yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, I, my, my strong right. belief is you'll see battle red shoot up and you'll see high drop shoot up. It'll, it'll inverse bell curve it. Yep. Interesting. Like as, as Kuhal said, um, imagine a world where people had to actually pay attention to how many drops they were. Sure. Crazy. What a beautiful right? world to live because, in. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's like, when was the last time that we were in the world where it's like, oh, you know, your average drops are four to six. Yeah. For 70% of the armies. Yeah. Yeah. I've been seriously thinking about uh, banning uh, Battle Reg from Vault Wars just to see, just to see. Like, just for the sake of different. I don't know if it's a better world, but it's just a different see what world. Happens. I'm ready, for, I'm ready sure. for a different world. I'm so tired of it. By the way, you <laughs> asked what I'd like to see in the in the, in the the seasons. Something like that would be an interesting yeah. change. What I mean by that is, yeah. like, switch up the actual core battalions in meaningful ways that, that create different build structures. That would be a meaningfully yeah. interesting thing to do, rather than trying to, like, tell this narrative through match play rules that are way heavy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's a match play pack. Make match play changes. I, mm. I just, I, I continue to believe we're just making a fundamental product management decision here, or, or misstep here, of misaligning our product with our personas. Like, that's mm. what it comes down to. Um, okay. All right. Grand strats. Uh, there's a lot of them. Okay. Uh, the ones that stand out to me, and I'll, I'll let yeah. you guys then also uh, talk about what, what, what you like, right? Uh, but uh, slot, Slaughter of Sorcery, A plus choice for me, plays right into what I wanted to do anyways, okay? Which is like, take yeah. no wizards, <laughs> right? <laughs> And then if I happen to play somebody else, if anti-magic wins and I play somebody else, so that becomes the more popular choice, they're also going to have Slaughter of Sorcery. I have Slaughter of Sorcery. Neither of us have Wizards. We both get our Grand Strat and we can just ignore this and move on. Like, you auto-get it if they show up with no Wizards. And you have no Wizards. That was my thoughts. Yeah, that was my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Right, I ended up with this for, for no Wizards, yeah. <laughs> what a win. What a wonderful world. Yeah. And most of the time, I'm going to be trying to kill their stupid Wizards anyways when they do have them. So... Uh -huh. Uh, perfectly aligned incentives there, right? Um, now, the spellcasting savant is the other one. If you're going to do Andes, um, you know, depending yeah. on how your ability to keep them safe, um, maybe that's went down, maybe it hasn't, you know, I don't know. But like, um, but like that's, you know, holding back an Andy and just making sure they live. Like if you've got a frog or something like that, it's not, yeah. it's not bad. You're gonna try yeah, to bodyguards. Die. Right, if you got heavy yeah, bodyguards you got bodyguard, and yeah. all of that, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Those are the two that yeah, it was. Me. Yeah, and then overshadow when the battle ends. The scratch strat. If all enemy battle line units from your opponent's starting army are destroyed, and there's at least one friendly battle line unit from your starting army on the battlefield. Sure. 
So not quite as easy as the OG for third edition, but still, yeah, that strikes me as one that we might see as, as a third option. Uh, Tom, are there any others that stood out to you? Um, I mean, Bear and Ice Scape is bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, so on the other side of this, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, no, it's worth mentioning how terrible it is, yes. Because, sure, in general, people are going to be incentivized to have multiple items when possible. Um, so if we do skew towards one drop, you, uh, most armies will only have one unit that you can kill here. But also keeping enemy units out of six inches of the center of the battlefield, right. that just may not be an option. If right. they have Archeon, yeah. good luck. Sure, or just yeah. they, they get the bottom of five. They just run to the middle touch the the six yeah. inch bubble and deny your grand strat like what an easy grand strat to deny right they just they just yeah. book it toward the middle with literally any unit yeah uh, it's so that gets a honorary mention for just bad sure um i mean i would also say yeah. magic made manifest is really bad as well uh just oh. because of uh how much we've talked about how endless spells can go get wrecked right and again so like you don't get the bottom right. of five they sure. do they just like boop, right. okay all those are gone cool you lose you lose your thing right right yeah this is yeah like of really a story of haves and have nots in this season everybody's going to take spell yeah. casting savant slaughter of sorcery and overshadow yeah yeah which is fine that's probably three out of six is i think more than we've had in last seasons so okay yeah cool yeah it was pretty rough last season yeah so okay. yeah not too bad in we've past seasons options. we've gotten like one or two out of six or like one and a half <laughs> yeah and, and mostly we've been living in take what's theirs and yeah and exactly. book you doing take what's theirs land, you doing so. take what's theirs we're all take what's theirs take what's theirs for everybody orange whip yeah. orange whip orange whips <laughs> okay all right battle tactics uh okay uh i don't know what happened there that was really weird okay cool uh, anyways, Intimidate the Invaders. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if there are more friendly units wholly outside your territory than there are friendly units within your territory. Okay. Very battle plan dependent, but cool. An easy turn one, top of one. One, like, leave your starting zone. All right. Yeah, or, yeah, or late game. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 one, you kind of choose your own adventure and the timing of this. It, it's yeah, sure. one you can hold on to. Um, yeah, particularly for the the split halfway, you can hold on to it for later in the game. Yep, yep. Yeah, it depends exactly. It depends a lot on like the nature of your uh, territory, right? Um, right. And what that looks like, and there there will be some interesting battle plans where that will will show up in in interesting ways. But okay. Yep. Uh, that one's fine. Like that one. Good. Mm -hmm. A plus. Uh, interesting on timing and how you use it and neat. It's, you know, I suppose yeah, you, hard you, to fail, but yeah. it's okay. It's, it's right. A, you're potentially you doing some hard. things. Right. And I you're, still you're like the incentive something. of it, which is get out of your home territory, which is nice. Yes, right. Well, on that point, I was just going to say that you're potentially doing some positioning things you don't want to be doing. Yeah. Or at least on the margins you don't want to do, saying. which is that's good. That's why I like it. Yes, I agree. Right. That's that's what I'm saying, right? It's sort of breaking okay. up your castle and say, hey, you got to go leave your, your, your safety bubble, right? Right. Yeah, there's, there's a number of things this season that are breaking up. They're affecting castles in healthy ways. So, so that's yeah, cool. I'm, I'm for this one. Yeah. Tom, you for this one? Yeah, yeah. I think that it uh it uh generates some interesting play opportunities. Okay. Uh reprisal. You complete this battle tactic if an enemy unit that destroyed a friendly general earlier in the battle is destroyed in this turn. I'm gonna give this one a thumbs up too. What I like about this one is it's mm. not an immediate uh kickback like you don't have to if your general died last turn you got to kill it this turn it can just be like at any point um and it just says a friendly general so like if somebody kills your war masters or stuff like that yeah all, the, all your bonus jennies mm -hmm. can still trip this off and suddenly turn this on for the rest of the fight obviously not a turn one a <laughs> uh, turn one top of one <laughs> choice <laughs> sure. yeah be impossible um but yeah i like this one it's good i like this is a, an interesting thing. Go after that unit. You have to, you know, you pick your times right. And, mm -hmm. you know, cool. Yeah, good. I felt like we had a scheme that was this back uh, in the day. Something like this. We had something pretty Maybe similar, we yeah. We had something uh, pretty similar. Yeah. 
That's that's cool. Go if you're getting desperate, need to go suicide. Your general, you're not spellcasting Savant. Your Grand Strat, it's not. You know, you, you don't care as much about. You can sacrifice your general and then to, to, to open up some avenue for for a battle tactic in a desperate situation. That's kind of neat. But yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Endless expropriation. That word. Uh, no. Nope. Not reading all the text, and it's a no. It's a no for me, dog. It There'll just be... it just simply is, yeah. All that it's saying mostly is pick a enemy wizard to destroy. Do a thing that in many that games bonded. will be impossible. <laughs> sure. Kill an enemy wizard, bonded. Basically, kill an enemy wizard that's bonded to an endless spell. Yep. Without mostly, you. that's what it's saying. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. Just dispelling down the spell doesn't get you there, which is what's insane to me about this, right? right. Like, like that was a slam dunk. Um, but, but no, uh, no, hard no. I, I mean, realistically, many people's games, four out of five games, many people play, especially with how I think the season will go. This won't even mm. be viable. Like this, you will literally have seven battle tactics because there will be zero endless spells or incarnates in the enemy list. So it's just like, sure. is yep. it even a thing? This is so specific and weird and I hate it. I just... It's a. This is an F. This gets a hard mm. F. Okay. So you're telling me you don't like when battle tactics or secondary objectives are so specific that in some games they won't actually impact the game? Uh, no, I'm saying this one gets an F. Okay. You're trying to trap me on a banners held high. Plenty of people have banners and totems, Tom, especially in the early period. I know what you're... Like, did you think that was going to be, like, clever? I know what you're going for, People had banners. No, no. I'm just uh, pointing out the the sarcasm and the irony. And the reality is that people will still have endless spells. I know that in general people won't, like many won't, but people definitely still will. There will still be things like uh, mirror, like it's 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 going to be out there. Yeah, yeah. All right, magical dominance. You complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn if a friendly wizard un unsuccessfully. Uh, no, that should be successfully. Oh, uh, that, that there you go. there's no way that's my fault. No, that was no me. way. I, no, that's me. I, that's me. <laughs> if a friendly wizard successfully cast, I just mistyped it because I was, you know, like reading and typing or whatever, oh. and just my brain said unsuccessfully. Gotcha. Uh, friendly gotcha. wizard successfully cast one or more spells, and none of the spells cast by any units in your army were unbound. Okay, this is a weird one because it says cast one spell then stop. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. yeah, I read this and I was like, Teclas pushes his spell out. You don't attempt anymore. Congratulations. Okay. Stop. You Stop while you're ahead, right? You know, there's no need to push it here. This is a weird one, actually, because this is uh, magical dominance. This is the hardest to achieve for uh, for spell dom armies that are also spell, spell bomb, spam yeah. armies. Because, right. as you pointed out, and I do think you're at least partially right, that like they will get spells, at least around the margins, chewed off, right? Yeah. Your chances of unbinding at least one spell goes way up, right? So but, like, Tom, magical... I, Tom, I was, partially, I was partially right. That's going to feed me for, for a month here. Let's, uh, partially give you a little, right. There you go, baby bird. Woo! You get a little... Um, yeah, I mean, yes, as people have pointed out, yes, multiple times with that, like... Uh, the you you have a wizard you you're not playing seraphon and you keep a wizard more than 30 inches away you cast mystic shield and turn one and stop casting at the top of one done got it yeah, yeah. be out of unbind range and cast your spell at the top of one like this will be a very common turn one top of one thing yeah. from a, from a, a a caster sitting at the back of the board throwing <laughs> a mystic shield on somebody <laughs> I really love this one. I mean, obviously, ridiculous name. Uh, it's the exact opposite of dominance. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. So, but yeah, I, I like, you, you laid everything out that I like about this and what it does to spell doms and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And yeah, it's early or potentially it's late uh, if you can get rid of wizards and then you have a wizard to cast a spell with primal dice in round four or five just to get this as a, as a last bit of a battle tactic. But yeah, I, I think it's cool. Yeah, it's fine. So I'm going to say... We've got, uh, what is that, three so far that feel pretty doable? Okay, cool. Yeah. Or, right. yeah. Yeah, like, it's possible. In, in the world yeah, of reprisal is tricky. Reprisal is yeah. tricky, but it's it's doable. It's, it's, it's yeah. doable. 
Again, because it's generous in its timing. That's why I'm giving it the, the into the dual sure. category. Sure. Magical yeah. Mayhem, pick one enemy unit on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic if that unit is destroyed by damage inflicted by a spell or the abilities of an endless spell. Oof. That is a high bar to cross for a lot of armies. Mm. Ironically, this is the Magical Dominance. Because Zinch looks at this and goes like, all right, we can get there, boys. Let's do this. <laughs> right. <sighs> right. But again, the more anti-magic yep. that's in the 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 world the harder this becomes to know you've got for sure right mm -hmm. um, for a lot of armies a lot of armies this is a non-starter like what, what are you banking yeah. on a merciless blizzard no no i know what you're banking on is uh an arcane bolt mm -hmm. on a unit with one wound mm -hmm. like <laughs> sure, you, right. like what yeah, you're doing marching. is you look across the battlefield and you're mm, that guy's on there it is yeah yeah yeah, no, that checks out. Yeah. Yeah, this one feels like a, a rarely achieved and a very difficult one, honestly, for a lot of armies. Or a very easily achieved one for a very few armies. That's how I would divide yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Like, I don't believe that you try to blizzard somebody. That's just, no, no, no. No, no, sure. no, no, no. Blizzard's going to draw a primal magic dice so fast on the on the, on the the unbind faster than you can, you can, you can say snow. Okay. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Hold on. So in this season, when you unbind a spell, instead of saying no, are you saying snow? I say snow <laughs> to that spell. Okay. I I appreciate when your cheese side comes out. Yeah, like that was really bad. Like Jesus, Tom Tom is struggling here, and you're pulling out that nonsense tonight. Okay. <sighs> All right. I got I got to keep you on point. <laughs> Uh, bait and trap. You complete this battle tactic if two or more friendly units are treated and two or more different friendly units have made a charge move this turn. Like this one a lot. Uh, yep. yep. It's great. It's very doable. It becomes really interesting with people who can hero phase do shenanigans. Uh, like, uh, who can hero phase charge or stuff like that. Right? Um, that actually becomes really interesting. Mm. Um, so. N N Nighthaunt looks at this as yes, please. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, because they're they're always wanting to retreat and charge. Now, obviously, the the two, uh, that was the two that um, you can't like have bring the same two units out and back in, which is what they sure. normally want to do. But it doesn't matter. Yes, retreating and charging mm -hmm. is basically in their in their wheelhouse, right? So yeah, agreed. Um, hey, it's something for Night Hunt. We don't get to say that very often. <laughs> yeah, love this one as well. Yeah, for it just it's really interesting working to set this one up, and it's just yeah, it's nice. Nice. I also encur I also like that it encourages fighting wide, and I generally like yeah. things that are anti Death Star yeah. and encourage fighting wide, which this does. Yeah, like get fighting in more places is good incentive to have in the in the game. So I'm gonna count this yeah. as a fourth one. Uh, so yeah. uh, that I think is 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 good. Uh, so yep. we're four for six so far. Led into the Maelstrom, you complete this battle tactic if one or more friendly heroes and one or more friendly battle line units each made a charge move this turn, and at least one of those units is within three inches of an enemy unit at the end of this turn. I kind of hate this, but it's fine. I hate tactics that punishing you for winning. Sure. What I mean by that is like, okay, I, I'm going to do this, and then I charge my hero and my unit into your unit, and we kill the enemy unit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i lose the battle tactic because i killed you too hard right <laughs> and that's a real like that's a real like new player trap that yeah. ends up happening obviously experienced players are just gonna like charge one of those units into multiple units you're gonna be with well, ex exactly units. so yeah. that way like i completely kill this unit this and then you know yeah. i'm still within three inches of the other thing i didn't want to charge right like right okay cool right you know, like, it's fine. This is a totally doable tactic. I just hate things that punish you for winning too much. Right? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, like, what did DJ Khaled ever do to you, okay? Like, I don't I don't understand why you're coming after him so hard. Uh, Fragam says, Informer by Snow, sing it when you unbind. First of all, that is really hard. Uh, I, I'm not, like, obviously I could like readily start doing informer off the top of my head. I, I did grow up in that time period, but uh, that's, that's not an easy one. All right. Surround and destroy. Pick three different friendly units on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic. 
at the end of your turn if each of those units is wholly within six inches of a different battlefield edge and two or more of those units are wholly outside your territory. Holy mm -hmm. crap. Three different friendly units. Uh, each of those units has to be wholly within six inches of a different battle edge. Battlefield edge. So they got it. Mm. Right? So one, yep. two, three, or one, mm -hmm. two, three. Right? Yep. Or whatever. You get it. Because you can't have there. And two of them have to be outside your territory. Good God. I didn't think you could get more wild than um, the Map Explorer one we had, right? Oh, yeah, Map we Maker. To touch yeah. all the corners, Map Maker. Yeah. Um, but, boy, did we do that was it. A, that was, I mean, that was popular. Well, well yeah, okay, people. I might have said something. So, Tom, did you, did but, you hate that one? Okay, go ahead. No, <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. fine. No, but, I mean, if you look at this, actually, like, this is first turn accomplishable if you have a teleporter in a number well, of scenarios. Sure. Yeah, it's it's battle tactic teleport. Uh, first yeah. off, it is battle tactic teleport. It is not battle tactic ambushers. Okay, people were uh, right, right because you got to yeah you got to be on the battlefield yeah, yeah. you got to be on the battlefield. That's right. So people like BOC who are trying to null deploy like I mean like obviously you could like come on all over the board, then the next round pick it right. That's fine, mm -hmm. but you can't do it while they're off board. Right. So like, sure, have to but, set up for it. but like, uh, like even looking at this, uh, geomantic pulse lines of communication, um, every step forward limited. No, maybe not. You'd have to have high mobility, but like a number of these you can get to like, Easily. They've got the the full the full width deployment. If, they have a, yeah. if you have a full width de deployment, you yeah. are easily turn one for that you know that that uh, yes. that tactic. Absolutely. Right. Yep. It matters a lot how you set up. Like the the nature of the um, battle plan is is crazy impactful to your ability to accomplish this thing. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, it is also battle tactic teleporter army yes absolutely yeah, like yeah. skaven are loving this one surround and destroy auto auto easy every time two points yeah. in the bank um but i like this one just fine uh so all in all i think there are six interesting ones here that i think are, are doable yeah. at, at worst let's count it five and a half because reprisal maybe it's yeah. maybe it's a pretty high bar but but i think there's easily five and a half to six uh so surround and, so you're counting surround and destroy in that i am counting surround and destroy yeah okay I think it's yep doable. and then and, I think it's doable in enough battle plans and there's enough yeah. teleporters and enough people with ambushers who could like drop them over in a corner and wait. Set it right? up and for the next, turn. It the next right. round and, and so on right. and so forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it might be a soft incentive for more or less to run, you know, like ether wing equivalent units, you know, just little units where their job is, which would be interesting to me. Just a little more variety. Yeah. And in, list building maybe to try to get this. So maybe a soft incentive to affect less. That's kind of cool. But yeah. Yeah, so not not too bad this this season of battle tactics. No, this is so. I, this is the funny thing that I talked about. Like, I actually like many of the things this season. The three different mm. grand strats that are good, I actually like them, and the way that they function, I actually kind of like what they're doing. I wish we had six out of six, but three out of six is better than previous seasons, and I like how different they all are. I mm. like six out of eight of these battle tactics quite a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. magical. Uh, uh, mayhem and and endless expropriation are the only two i don't like and I, that's because they lean too much yeah. into the current wackadoo season right right um so like this is the you asked again to answer your question a third time what would i like to see this is the kind of stuff i want to see just like hey really mm -hmm. cool interesting battle tactics that encourage different play that break up castles and make you want to go wide and fight on yeah. your fronts and you know get yourself around the battlefield more like to me, that's good stuff. Like that's changing the play experience moment to moment, right? Right. Like I, I don't need entire bolt-on systems that are like, let's throw fifty more magic dice at you in pages of rules text, and and what will <laughs> undoubtedly be like two pages of FAQs, right? All right, battle plans. We're there, everybody. We did it. We got there. Okay. Uh, this will actually be pretty fast because a lot of these will just be like going through the the basic thing and then and then moving through. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Battle plans. I love this piece of art. It has nothing to do with battle plans. I just thought it was a neat piece of art. Okay. Geomantic pulse. 
All right. So it's a, the four objectives across the center of the board. Start a second battle round. The player who goes second chooses either A or B to be the pulse. And then for the rest of the game, it's going to travel in the opposite direction. Bup, 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 bup. So two, three, four, five. Or sorry, two, three, four, five. Or two, three, four, five. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens. That's a travel this direction or a travel this direction. Okay. Yep. Uh, cool. And objectives can't be moved. Standard scoring stuff. Um, if you control the or it's pseudo standard scoring, I should say, because it's like mm. control one objective is a VP. Control the pulse is two VP. Each objective adjacent to the pulse is one VP. All right. So it's it kind of works out the same. We sort of backed mm. into almost the standard scoring. Depending, there will be there will be interesting rounds like in three and four. You get this extra ghost point that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but being able to set up your being able to make this choice uh, as the player taking the second in turn two is actually quite powerful um, mm-hmm. for based on like where yeah. your army is and where you think your strength sits. Right. Okay. Yeah, because you're looking at seven up to seven points in yeah. those in those mid turns, in... those two mid turns. Yeah, yep. that's right. Over that be? That's right. Yes, in three and four. Three and four, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Um, like in turn one, mm-hmm. you uh, only yeah, have one VP three. available. Well, battle like, tactic. From, from yeah, I'm I'm counting from yeah, objectives. Yeah. Sure. Right. In turn two, you have uh, four from objectives. In turn three and four, you have five. And then in turn five, you go back to four. Right? So it goes one, yep. four, five, yep. five, four is your, your right. actual objective points. Okay. Sounds right. Yeah. Cool. Good. And then obviously battle tactics stack on top of that as normal. Uh, Geomantic Pulse. Yeah, I don't hate this one. Easy deployment. Mm. Love the deployment map. This is one of my favorite. Just a simple deployment map. It's a classic... Nice horizontal spread, get you get you moved out across the board. Good scoring. Um, Going second turn two is quite powerful. Turns three and four, I really think you will end up scrumming in the middle, trying to get at those those bonus points you mentioned. Right. Just right. a slight downside. But I'd I'd rather have the scrum in the middle on turn three and four than one and two. Sure. Honest answer. I gave this one a seven out of ten. Nothing incredible. Very ready for play. Tournament ready. Yeah. It, Tom, what's your vote? You in the same place? Yeah, it's a great just uh, run of the mill, um, vanilla scenario. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. other than the kind of unusual scoring situation with the with the four objectives, which is a nice mix, right? Yeah. Um, I I appreciate um, I appreciate it. Although I will say it goes back back to what we were talking about. Um, about the ter- the turn two or the second or like the bottom Going of the turn. Going second continues to get Going stronger. Second. Touch the pin. Yeah. Touch the pin. <laughs> All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, Nexus collapse. So this uses the box to box, corner to corner deployment, um, which yep. will make things like surround and destroy potentially harder. Like, because here you're only adjacent to two when you begin, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So that's just always something we should think about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but other than that, standard nine inch away. Again, I like this deployment. Um, instability. At the start of each battle round after the first, after determining which player will take the first turn, the player with the fewest victory points can choose to collapse up to two objectives. If both players are tied on victory points, the players roll off and the winner can choose to collapse one objective. Roll a dice for each unit within six inches of any collapsed objectives. On a four plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Once all rules have been made for those units, remove all collapsed objectives from the battlefield. Okie dokie. So six objectives to start, right? Mm. And then from turn two on, the person with the lowest VP can collapse two, or you roll off and you collapse one, right? So you actually can get to zero objectives in this. Sure. Though it yeah. would not probably make sense to do so. But it is possible which is interesting okay upside easy deployment love this deployment map i love a square to square six mm. objectives to begin and a good spread like i like the positioning on them is really nice across the board good scoring 
The catch-up mechanic is really interesting since it's the lower victory points, not just going second in the round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually really like that as a catch-up mechanic. My downside is I really hate the random rule for collapsing objectives. I really, really hate it. It sounds min it sounds minimal at first, but think about it this way. The games that are the tightest, that you're playing like that you're you're like pacing the, the opponent, right? Mm. Yeah? Where you're you're tied on victory points. Yeah. Those are generally your most intense, equally matched games. Right? Okay, in those games, we've now introduced a very swingy element. Because sure. Now you just roll off and just randomly one person is going to get to go up on scoring because they'll collapse the objective they want. Reminds me of an Ashcon game where it came down to a Scorched Earth die roll on a D3. If right. I rolled a three up by one, if I didn't, we tied. Yeah, it's like, okay, well, I mean, it's, yeah, just it's, weird. But, and the difference there that I think is that I'm really trying to drill in on, yeah. right, is ironically, they, they, like, they probably wrote that text thinking like, well, we got to have some way to decide, and it's, that's the easy way to decide, right? Mm -hmm. Where I would have just preferred, if you're tied on victory points, nobody collapses an objective. That would have been a far better way to write it. Because yeah. why did we just decide, if you're playing a really good, evenly matched game, where you're both just like, you know, really do it, like, just punch and trade and punch for punch, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, let's just make it more random and swingy. <laughs> like, sure. no, no, yeah. wrong choice. You, like, they didn't think that through, right? And and that it's that kind of thing that really bothers me because it didn't Absolutely. need to be there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? They were doing, yeah. like, the catch-up mechanic is really good. The lower victory points is really good design. The map is well-designed. Like, everything here was banging for me. And then I read that and I was like, ugh, ugh, right? Uh, yeah, I agree. The, so the only asterisk I would add to the nice catching mechanic is when I read this initially, what came to my mind is go second and be ideally one point behind, like five, sure. five, four. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it just feels like that's a natural pull that this has as, as an orientation, if you can, which then creates an interesting question in the mind of the player who's going first and what are they doing? And, you know, just, so it's kind of interesting, but I, I do worry, I, I have to play this a number of times to get a feel for it, but I do worry that maybe this will have a sizable impact, this mechanic that can make for swinging games. I hope not. Like, my feeling is it's probably good, but I don't know until I play it. It's an interesting thing. I hadn't even thought that part through, but yeah, you're right. Like, in, like intentionally not take three objectives, you know, so you're just like that in the battle tactic, I'll score four. Okay, let's go right. into turn two. Cool, I get to collapse your two objectives and then, you, right. you know, set up my own position. Yeah. By the way, the extra mortal wounds thing is just silly and shouldn't be there. Like, just stop. Sure. Just stop writing the text. Somebody should have just smacked their hand. Like, just stop. That text did not need to be there. It's irrelevant extra text. We don't need to be doing this splash mortal wound thing. I hate all that. I hate the silly splash mortal wound thing. Yeah. It's, it just doesn't need to exist. Stop it. But, yeah, it's kind of a interesting kind of, you know, game theoretic uh, context that this one can create and, and the d different potential scenarios to, to consider. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's... But overall, but I still point. gave this one a seven out of ten, because yeah. I still think it's good. And in most instances, you know, you'll 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 have it'll be fun. You'll, though I think it will spawn some real feel bad moments here and there. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Tom, anything else? You did I miss anything there from your perspective? No, no, I think that hits it all. Okay. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, lines of communication. Again, nice. Simple deployment. Good. Dig it. Fantastic. Keep it up. Uh, disruption. At the start of each battle round, after determining which player will take the first turn, the player taking the second turn can pick a phase to disrupt, where they get total eclipse. During that battle round, each time a model in their opponent's army issues a command trait in that phase, their opponent must roll a die. On a three-up, an additional command point must be spent in order to issue... They can choose whether or not to. If they don't, the command fails, and the command point is lost, and the command point counts as being issued. Okay? So, what does this mean? This means that the person going second, right, is just going to pick the combat phase. <laughs> okay? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so that you're all out attack and all at defense, both get harder. I mean, depending. Like, the generic choice is just the combat phase, right? Absolutely, yeah. 
And then when you try to do that stuff, you they're going to roll a die, and on a three up, suddenly you're total eclipsed. Yep. Okay, that's what it is. Other than that, score normal. <laughs> yes, Keith Rogers said, but Vince, you can play this battle plan and cast total eclipse. Wonderful. <laughs> Ah, uh, easy deployment, good scoring. The disruption mechanic will be very painful to some armies and completely irrelevant to others. Most of the time, it will just default to the combat phase. I also hate the timing of it. I hate that you, like, make the choice here and then need to remember to make the rolls later on. Like, sure. the number of times we're going to hear, I issue all at attack. Okay, cool, I issue all at defense, blah, blah, blah. And life goes on. They're like, oh, crap, you were supposed to roll a three up to right. see if you should have spent an extra command point. Yeah. Like, um, that's going to happen you, a lot. Did you well, have any armies in mind when you say you think this will be very painful for some armies? Sure, people who want to spend CPs but don't have any extra CP mechanics to, to, to gain them, right? Like, yeah. But whereas, like, your pretenders to the Nash is just like, <laughs> who cares? Yeah. I cannot be disrupted. I get, you know, 20 command points a turn. Suck it. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, that that's what I'm thinking of largely. Con you know, command yeah. constrained armies who, who still care about it. Um, I gave this one a 5 out of 10. Like, it's fine. Three, I didn't mention it, but three objectives is always somewhat questionable. We're, like, definitely on a board, on a, on a, on a borderline there. Mm. Um, so, but, like, this one's I, I'm 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 being generous with the five out of ten on this one in my mind. What do you think about this one, Tom? Yeah. Um. I mean, I think that the that the three objective scenarios in general are problematic for playstyle, um, and they de incentivize mobility, especially when they're lined up in the middle like this. Yeah. Sure. As opposed to, like, um, the other one we had last season where they were like this, and then one in the middle. Yes, like, yeah. that's exactly right. Like, ha like I feel more comfortable with those. Um, I uh, I think that this is going to generate some just not super enjoyable games. Yeah, I could I could be moved to may have marking this one a 4 out of 10. I'll say that right away. Like, because of that reason that I didn't really, you know, like... The, I'm so iffy on the three objectives lined up on the center line I, for, for all the reasons you just said, Tom. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as someone else like, said, amusing park said, by the way, good Lord, you're going to hit KO in the movement phase because yeah, they want to do all their, their commandability movement phase stuff. And like, they're going to get whacked by this and that's not going to be a fun time for them. So. Yeah. I'd be curious to see how much this is played. I mean, like we've had missions like this in the past that were relatively popular with various versions of this, not with the disruption rule, but I just mean the three objectives. I mean, sure. like shifting objectives, uh, sure. the first blood, first blood had a, a really nice layout diagonally and, and good deployment territories. But yeah, cause like, it's very simple. This obviously this mission, it's the simplest or, or one of the simplest of, of all of these, but so uh, yeah, the but... thing that everybody's going to forget all the time, which is also crazy. Sure. Yes. Right, exactly. Somehow yeah. both of those will be I... true. Yeah, I don't know how, I, honestly, I don't know guys how I feel about this one. Like, I could see it not being, the... it, it's probably going to be too impactful and too MP, and to, yeah, elicit too many negative experiences because of the nature of this rule. That is, But that's the point of the rule. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I agree. This is a weird one. I could be moved to a 4 out of 10. I won't be surprised if we don't see this a lot. I just, I really don't think people are going to find this one fun. It reminds me of, um, against some armies, it's just utterly crippling, right? Sure. Um, it reminds me of a number of scenarios we've had in the past that, where we have similar situations, whether it would be like, uh, um, places, was it places of power that was like wizard based? Yeah. yeah. Right. And, or I think about something like a, um, like worry, every, we're going we're gonna to get to a wizards of power or to a places of power when it's coming. Un understandable. Um, or a, like, uh, everybody, ha like no reserves, everybody has to be deployed. Like mm -hmm. it just, and it, it inordinately hits to me from a design standpoint for scenarios, it, it touches a third rail where it, it, skews the actual um 
uh, experience for some armies when it's not actually affecting some armies at all. Yeah. Mm. And what's funny is there are versions of the two scenarios you just mentioned we haven't gotten I to know. yet. I know. <laughs> I know. We'll get there. So as a, this one echoes those, but why echo when we can just basically have the new versions of both of those, Tom? I'm aware. Why just pay homage? All right. So now this one would honestly be a pass for me. All right. Keep going. Every step is forward. Uh, okay, sure. This deployment plus nine inches. Like, boy, do you have that little tendril out there? The risk it for the biscuit tendril. Uh, <laughs> but I, I hate these kind of maps. But whatever. It's not. This isn't the worst, but it's still not great. Give no ground. If a unit makes a charge move until the end of that turn, add one to the number of models that each model in that unit counts as for the purpose of contesting objectives. If a unit retreats until the end of that turn, models in that unit cannot contest objectives. Uh, hold one, hold two, hold three more. Okay. Upside. Deployment tendrils allow for some really interesting risk-reward deployments. Mm -hmm. I love the deployment tendrils. I really do. Especially for redeploy yeah. armies, by the way. People who can, like, after setup do yeah. redeploys. Like, what a, what a great... Yeah. They love a map like this, right? Yeah. Bastion and Soul Blight. And, yeah. yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Night Haunt. Yep. Night Haunt. Uh, nice objective spread. Good. Good. Like, I like the spread on this a lot. It's quite wide. You're really going to be fighting across a lot of the board. Scoring solid. The mm -hmm. downsides, annoying actual setup to determine starting areas. Look, I'm going to mention it every time. It's not like a huge thing in my overall rating, but like it's there and I don't like it. But at the same time, I'm willing to put up with it because I do like the little tendrils. So, okay. Mm -hmm. And then retreat isn't shut off, but it is a big penalty and a pretty common tactic. Um, it's maybe not bad, but it's interesting. I don't know. Like, Sons of Bamat, uh, Night Haunt, like, armies that want to go retreat away to do things that have that as part of their their theory of, how well, their, of the case, that really sucks for you. Or, or let me get this right, just use their allegiance mechanics. Sure. Like, because retreating to, to objectives is pretty popular, pretty common. And right. suddenly, oh, yes, I do have the wrong tactic on this side. You told me that, and I didn't change it. Yeah. I, I forgot to make your fix. Every step is forward. There you go. <laughs> Fixed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, I mean, again, like to me, this just sorry, seems thanks, egregious. Both of you. This this seems just egregious against things like like Nighthawk, right? Sure. Where like like what it does says is is that either you get your allegiance abilities, or you get to claim objectives, but you don't mm -hmm. get to do both. Yeah. That seems problematic sure sure yeah if it weren't for I, I love this one but the night hunt issue is a real problem that's that's very unfortunate i mean i i, li I really like the idea of uh, permitting you from doing something you would normally do in the game it's such a common tactic to just retreat and still score i, I like that concept as an orientation of a mission I, I love the map i love the objective placement i love everything about this but the night hunt asterisk is is a little tough Maybe, maybe a couple of you. Yeah. There's a couple armies that are going to get hit. No, I'm going to say a couple. I mean, really a couple. Um, that are going to get hit pretty hard by this. But otherwise, I give this... I do. I did rate this one a 7 out of 10. I mean, if you're a Nighthawk player, you're probably get rating this lower. If you're a Sons of Bama player, you're probably rating this lower. Right? If you're sure. a Doc... Uh, which, what's the... Um, what's the, the Doc? Uh, Kelnar. Kelnar. Kelnar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, you, where, you, where you have the retreat and stuff every round. Yeah, that's, that's probably bad. Um, now... That being said, okay, like, I think it's still a perfectly acceptable for attorney. Like, I, I, I think you'll see it. That's what I'll say. I, I think the fundamentals of the map are good. And I think if you're a Nighthawk player or one of those armies, um, you just need to, like, be aware that this is a thing and figure out how you're going to play around that, right? Like, it, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Warble. Kind of wish they'd bring back shifting objectives, focal points, or similar. It makes the game fair, but just has enough of a spin to be interesting. Boy, do I have a project for you, buddy. Just yeah, indeed. wait. All <laughs> right. Uh, limited resources. Okay. So this is a very interesting map as far as the objectives go. Like, what a what a wild map, right? Um, Holy within your territory, nine inches away. Standard, standard. Siphon Meltwater. When a player gains control of an objective, they start to siphon Meltwater from it. After scoring victory points, if the player whose turn it is controls an objective that they controlled at the end of their previous turn, 
They have yes. siphoned all the meltwater from that objective. For the rest of the battle, that player cannot control that objective. And then the designers notice to say, hey, you can still contest the objectives. In other words, preventing your opponent from doing it. So the maximum okay. amount of time you can score off of any one objective is two rounds. Unless it's interrupted by your unless opponents. it's interrupted, unless it's interrupted, in which case it's three rounds. Yeah, because then either you have to go one interrupt, <laughs> three, four right. done, right? Because right. you did yeah. two rounds in a row, or one interrupt, three interrupt, five. So yeah. you can either do two or three with interruption, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And All obviously, right. if you move if you move away from it, and there's no enemy units, you still control it. You still that's control the, it. That's right. You can't just walk world. away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll still control it. You'll still siphon the 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 meltwater off of it. You'll still then burn it out for you, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh All right. Upsides: simple deployment, nice objective spread, good scoring. Upside: meltwater. Downside: meltwater. Turning readiness, <laughs> 7 out of 10. Like, the Meltwater thing, I I was so torn on this one. But I guess still went 7 out of 10. And let me tell you why. Because I think the Meltwater thing of being able to control the objective only two rounds is actually really interesting with six objectives and how it encourages movement around the board and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I really like it. Okay? I love the idea that it's like pushing you around the board to keep seeking out new new objectives that you can control and take and stuff like that. That is fantastic, conceptually. Okay? Right? Mm. But the downside is the meltwater and remembering it. Like, people are going to forget, like, have to sit there and be like, wait, did I control this one again? Like, get especially out, if they get in a Get out. Get right? out your tokens. Get out your yeah. tokens. Yeah, exactly. When you stack two, put a little penny on top of the objective when you've done it once. When you yep. add the second penny, that one's done for you, right? You can't touch yep. any objective with two pennies on it or something. You know, <laughs> like a secondary game aid is going to be extremely valuable here. Yes. So it's both an upside yeah. and a downside, but I still think this one's cool. I just think it's cool. I think it's my, probably my favorite of this pack. Yeah, It's pretty, I, I played it uh, Tuesday. When did I play it? No, last week. And fascinating, absolutely fascinating how it plays, at least in that first experience. Yeah, yep. it, it's it's quite it's it's a different it's a different different than your average game and and how you're thinking about it and how you're doing things and like you said you're yeah definitely playing around the board, uh, real consideration of again like these these game theoretic situations that are that are coming up and yep. the, the decision making between the two players it was, really enjoyed it. Nice, Tom. Yeah, what I would say is that it is going to create very unique play experiences right. and incentivize very unusual moves in the game. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, where people are wanting to like jump across or do very like very nonlinear approaches to yep. to play. Um, or you might that's one hand. The other hand is you'll you're going to see a lot of sweeping maneuvers um, where people start on one side and then as a wave kind of rotate around. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not not getting on too many objectives early, right? Potentially, sure. Yeah, sure. not not start not starting the clock too early on too many objectives. Yeah. yeah. So like, look, the downside of this one's obvious: the bookkeeping, the memory stuff, all of that, right? But to yeah. me, I actually think this one's worth it. That's that's why I still came down with a good score, because the yeah. different play style it encouraged, I think, is interesting enough that it's worth a little bit of like the the, the mental cost here. Mm. That's my general take. Okay, cool. Yep. Oop, sorry. Spring the trap. Uh, so three objectives, but this time spread quite wide, right? So they're not on the mm -hmm. middle line. There's an extra distance here. The shorter box deployment, nine inches away. So this is like the small deployment zone, right? Yeah. Uh, which obviously has like some concerns around how big your army is, but for the most part, I don't, I don't mind it. Mm -hmm. Um. During deployment, after both players have set up their units, starting with the attacker. I gotta figure out who the attacker is again. I never like I never like I ever think about that, but sure. Each player can remove D3 units from the battlefield, roll once for both players, and place those units in reserve. Starting from the second battle round, at the end of your movement phase, you can set up those units you placed in reserve, 
wholly within six inches of the battlefield edge and more than nine inches from all enemy units. There is a massive problem with this <laughs> battle yeah. plan that needs to be FAQ'd immediately. <laughs> Before I flip the slide, Tyler, what's the problem with this, with this uh, battle plan? Yeah, right now, Vince, you've, you've got that, that stupid lizard named Croak, or that, that frog named Croak. I'm just going to pick him up, buddy. I'm going to pick him up because exactly. this is what the rules tell me that I can do. And potentially two other units, and yeah, you're just not going to get to play with him for a while. <laughs> Correct. As it's written right now, I can pick up your units, and then I get to put your units onto the battlefield. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so, obviously yeah. that will be FAQ to be corrected. Like, there's no world where they're letting that fly. Okay, right. like, 100% I mean, it's clearly meant to be your units you're putting into reserve. Sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I really like this one, assuming that gets fixed. Like, yeah. really like this one. Uh, yes. So, agreed. Upside, simple deployment, nice objective spread, good flooring, good good scoring. Uh, outflank, if I could only remove and set up my units. Downside, outflank, <laughs> if I could remove and set up enemy units. It's a no. two three. It's a, it's a two out of ten or an eight out of ten, depending on how <laughs> outflank, how quickly outflank gets gets FAQ'd. I agree. I think this is a really good one. Yeah. yeah. Reminds me a little bit. Of, yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah. And I like how it's both uh, spread out from an objective standpoint. Mm. Um, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Am it's I only three objectives, but yeah. it's but they're much more spread out, right? And and mm -hmm. you're starting not near yes. any of them, right? Right, which right. I also like. I like when you don't actually start near any of the objectives. Like, there's no home objective. You've got to go out there and get get the get the gold. Right. I yep. actually really like yep. that design. Yep. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of meeting engagements with how meeting engagements worked with units coming in from different board edges and sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice like every people like it's it's cool that it actually gives a little bit of interesting, you know, sort of ambush potential to some units. Like there's this works well with the surround the the enemy or whatever battle tactic, right? So like yeah. a lot of good stuff there. Scarbrand popping out 3d6 charge. Sure. From this, from this thing. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Fun uh, stuff, right? Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I really like Spring the Trap. I agree. I think this is one of the strong ones in there. Again, assuming Outline gets like very quickly FAQ'd, which I assume it will because they're not insane. Right. Um. Okay. Yeah. Eric Doty says I cast Banishment on Croak. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we just had D three units of free Banishment at the start of the game. Oh, Eric. Man, that's a callback. Banishment. Yes. Wow. That was the last time they let you touch the opponent's models, and we had to get rid of that real fast. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, clearly, like, history tells us that's going away. Um, Fountains of Frost. Uh, so, again, six objectives with the nice three and three uh, sort of at the home. Geysers mm. of Primal Magic. Uh, Andes count as ten models for the purposes of contesting objectives. At the start of each battle shock phase, roll a dice for each objective that is contested by three or more units. On a four up, each contest each unit contesting that objective suffers D three mortal wounds. Roll separately for each unit, and then hold one, hold two, hold more. Okay. All right. So like, your Andes count as a lot more. They all get to be uh, stone horns. But if you happen to be overholding an objective, like if you have too many people on it, you risk some kickback. Okay. Cool. Upside. Deployment. Good. Objective spread. Good. Scoring. Good. Love a three and three, <laughs> six objective. You got to push yeah. into theirs to hold that one more. Yes, yes, yes. Nice, decent DMZ in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. Downside, the stupid splash mortal wounds thing. Why does that exist? It's so extra. It just doesn't need to be there. I like, kind of like it here. I mean, I, I agree with you in general. I always agree in general with this because it's extra stuff. But I do kind of, I, I love the disincentive to castle or to, to have to multiple over units. camp. Yeah, the problem is camp, this, yeah. this scenario already did a good job of that by uh, having a three and three true. spread. Yeah, that's true. By having like six objectives with that spread, you were already heavily incentivized not to overcamp. 
So yeah. like we did the work. Then we just I'm, kept writing uh, rules. That's yeah. I mean that's kind of true. Like, like I'm thinking of not just power pairs, but you know your quad units where you've got uh, l like my Lorcastellan, Bandus, Relictor, and Ten and they're all hanging out because they all go together in a spot. Sure. Sure. Okay, so this distance advises that. I love that. And there, sure. There's a number uh, of armies you're that just have set like two of those guys right outside the zone and two of those guys in the zone. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess what's the? Oh, just contesting range. Yeah, it's uh, contesting. That's so, yeah, fair. Like, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Like, you could just do that. Yeah. It's just yeah. extra fiddle bookkeeping. Yeah, I didn't think about that. For like yeah, no right. real reason. Right. Now that being said, this is still a seven out of ten. It's a great, it's, it's a great, I'm not going to hold the one silly rule that just didn't need to be there. And, and, and anybody with like half a brain in their head will never trip over like ever. Mm. Okay. Because it's still a nice, uh, scenario. Like it sucks that like, okay. Andy's get to be worth a lot. Fine. That's cool. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but it's 10. It's not, it's That's not completely fine. out of control. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like That's even if you're playing without Andes, it's not like you can't take that that thing away from them. Right, right. Because yeah. they, they, you know, it's fine. Tom. Yep. <laughs> right. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at right now. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's all fine. Right. Like, uh, there, it's fine. Like, I think it's it's a. I think it is perfectly acceptable. It's yeah. a, around the number of uh, objectives that you want. Uh, I hate that it ties to unit composition, but it's fine. Yeah. yeah. The actual like big downside to me here is the Andes counting as 10 because there's armies that just won't have them at all. Like there's armies that can't have them right. at all. And mm -hmm. so like that kind of stuff is always negative to me, right? I don't, I, I don't love it. But, but at least it's not extra victory points. It is just like counting as more, which can still be fought against, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not extra scoring, which I yeah. appreciate. Spoilers. Yeah. yeah indeed. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. yeah. All right. And yes, as pointed out by by um, Kuhal, it, it is total units. So like if they have two when you run in with your third, you turn it on, right? The 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 splash zone. You turn on mm -hmm. the splash zone. Yeah. But like realistically, if they have two units and you're running in with your unit you're hoping that uh, those units, at least one of those units, doesn't exist anymore after you're mm -hmm. done with your charge, as often happens in AOS, so you're back to two units again. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. The ice fields. Uh, create a circle around the middle and let's go fight in it. Uh, okay. Uh, annoying lengthwise deployment. Ice encrusted domain. Each time a unit runs, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. When you make a charge roll for each dice that shows a 1 before modifiers are applied... The unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Let's cut to the chase. I hate this scenario. It's a skip. The scoring is fine. I hate running mortal wounds. I Lots of support heroes will just kill themselves running around the board. That's terrible. Like, God forbid you have a run and charge army. Your support heroes all just kill themselves moving around trying to keep up with the units that are all actually fighting. Ditto for the charging. Oops, oops, you accidentally killed your support hero because they charged in. Like, they've been doing a lot of work to make support melee foot heroes actually want to go get in fights and fight with their friends. You know, with the whole, like, mm -hmm. like chain activation. Well, oops, you accidentally killed that guy. How fun. He was just trying to go fight, and he killed himself. What a great time that is. Like, rolling snake eyes doesn't already suck enough on charging. Right? <laughs> sure. Now you can just get kicked when you're down. Right? Like, fail and take 2d3 mortal wounds. Wow. Great. <laughs> okay. Um the 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 circle around the middle just ends up to being where units are all going to be up in each other's business because of the distance there. Uh it's lengthwise deployment which sucks at tournaments. I'm sorry, I won't let this go. I don't care. Lots of tournaments run with tables butting up against each other. I hate walking all the way down the stupid table row and all the way to the other side every time I just need to reach <laughs> a unit. It's annoying. Uh, or I have to be like, hey, my opponent, can you please move my model exactly in the way that I would want it to be moved perfectly? What a great yeah. time. Three out of ten, skip it. I like it. 
Oh, oh I'm how? Excited. How after Herner's oh. tables and all the time you saw that this rule sucked? <laughs> do you want to play in this? Because it 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 introduces some interesting weird decision points. Now, uh-huh. what I want to what I want to affirm is that it it does all the things that I don't like that the anti night haunt table is doing. Yeah, like exactly. If, all your yeah. dumb night haunt heroes that want to retreat and charge are all dead. Agreed. Agreed. But here's okay. the deal. If we're going to play with that other scenario, this needs to be in there too. Like we need to properly penalize everybody. <laughs> How about we just don't use like, either? <laughs> like, because, you know, because this really hurts like armies that like the whole army to get stuck in. Right, like forces that you you want everybody to get stuck in because you're going to be throwing more charge dice. Um, so what I would say is this: I think that this is part of a package of scenarios in this packet that, to me, if you're going to want run one, you need to run all of them. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I would just and, skip both of them. I really hate this this. Scenario. Which which and if that's what I'll say is this. I agree with you. I don't like the staggered deployment or like the 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 lengthwise deployment. I think that's it's terrible for events. Agreed. But but um, I like this like six six objective staggered yeah. um, formation. Like it's yeah. really interesting to me from mm-hmm. a spacing standpoint. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, we could have run so- it horizontally with the same deployment, and I would have been fine. But okay. Sure. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it is different because here you have three solid objectives that you're able to fortify and bunker. With the other one, you have two that you have to move up on two more. That is mm. a very different like deployment challenge. I agree, and um, I like the second scenario you you charted out better. <laughs> yeah, and I understand that. I understand that. Um, all that to say, I don't hate ice fields, even though like I hate it for what it is forcing Mm -hmm. at the same time i think that it can be valuable yeah what a what a wild take i i don't think shooting castle armies needed a best scenario that they were so excited to show up in well but this is what i'm saying like this is part of a constellation of scenarios that everybody gets penalized Mm -hmm. you know like in in this world of like deployment and uh, and keywords and all that stuff and if everybody has a shitty scenario right then i feel less bad about like having the if you're night haunt you lose you lose the scenario sure that's fair tyler anything we missed uh, i'm just excited tom's talking a lot so uh we i welcome really up enjoy- uh, yeah I'm, I'm really enjoying yeah i'm good i'm good Okay. Well, let's talk about the things that are going to keep penalizing the other people then. All right. Power flux. (laughs) Okay. So you got four objectives, A, A, B, B. Cool, cool. And standard horizontal deployment with nine inches. Aether surges. In this battle, players can only score victory points for objectives they control if the objective has been activated. At the start of each battle round, after determining which player will take the first turn, the player taking the second turn. Touching the pin. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll choose which pair of objectives, either A or B, are active for that battle round. Okay? Uh, you control at least one objective, you get a VP. You control both activated objectives, you get a VP. Each activated objective you control that is contested by a friendly Antidorian Locust that has no enemy Andes near them, it's a VP. Any enemy wizard units destroyed that battle round, it's a VP. Any wizards. Okay. Yeah. Okay, scoring. Interesting scoring to me. Simple deployment. Large benefit for going second. Mm. Uh, That could be both an upside and a downside. I don't know. Potential for some very high scores or inability to score based on wizards in each army, right? Like the, 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 um, the, it's any enemy wizards, not one per, but if I can space that out over the course of the, the, my turns and like, Turn one, I kill one of your wizards. Turn two, I kill one of your wizards. Turn three, I kill one of your wizards. Right? Sure. If I'm if I'm if I'm piecing out my my meal, yeah, mm-hmm. then I can I can run up a heck of a score depending on the sort of the wizards that you have. Right? 
to me, this is actually quite a massive anti... Anytime you just give direct points for killing a thing, it becomes a strong anti that thing. Uh, yeah, the the issue that I have with this, though, is the scoring before it. Each activated objective you control contest by friendly Andy, and that's no enemy Andy, contesting at 1 BP. Each active activated objective, sure. right? So There's not... To... They did not... They did not specify the any there, so there, there's, there's a, there's inequity right there, potentially in some of these matchups where, yeah, if you're not able to get some wizard off the board quickly enough, you can really get down in scoring potentially in, in some in some games I could see. So I don't know. I personally, I, I that's my main problem with this one. That should be any in my mind, so that you cap it at one period. And that, that in that's interesting. I'm putting that in both both cases. The upside and the downside now say large benefit for going second. Mm. Uh, this one I gave a 6 out of 10 I could be argued to a 5 honestly it's like it's swingy boy that incentive for going second is really big like I am I am tough on that one <laughs> that is mm. it's hard to say I don't know how impactful it's going to be uh, yeah I mean on this one it just seems like you want to build in such a way that you can threaten a A. Yeah. Or sorry, BB, you can, BB. I apologize. BB. But yeah. you don't get horizontally. to choose BB. So if you go second, you'll get to choose which one you want. But if they have multiple wizards, uh Andy Wizards, they can jump in on those and score a bunch of bonus points. So it's gonna be a real interesting like intersection mm, between mm. their Sure. Their composition, like the way that you you beat one drops here, is you have two wizards that can get on both points. Yeah, yeah, and then they give you first turn, and you run up and like boom, you've just like you run the up score. the scoreboard. Yeah, yeah. By, by selecting, you know, they pick B. If they pick BB, they know they give you the chance to run up the score, which then naturally makes them have to pick AA, right? right. Which yep. then lets you get the free point, but not take their home point and limits yep. it. So like. There's a lot of interesting if I if this then this yeah. and again. That's why I still went six out of ten, five out of ten. I'm not sure. I'm really yeah. not sure. Like I need to play this one to feel it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I um, Eric, one. as an aside, he asked about what about killing Lumineth wizards wizard units. Uh, those units don't have the wizard keyword. Yeah, correct. They do not have the wizard keyword. Yeah. So they they won't count for this. Right. It's about the actual whoa, 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 wizards. Yep. Okay. Uh, cool. The Frigid Zephyr. Yeah. All right. Uh, one of my favorite map setups right here. I love this map setup, uh, which is the deployment goes like this, but the, the objectives yeah. go like this. Love it. Love the X. Uh, X marks the spot of fun. Ferocious Squall. At the start of the battle, the battlefield is affected by a squall. Until the squall dissipates, units more than 12 inches apart are not visible to each other. In addition, until the squall dissipates, models cannot fly. At the start of each battle round, because it's well known that ghosts highly affected by the weather. Um, <laughs> at the start of each battle round after the first, after determining which player will take the first turn, if the squall has not dissipated, the player taking a second turn rolls a die and adds the number of the current battle round to the score on a seven plus the squall dissipates. I don't know why the player going second gets to roll the die. I'm not touching the pin on this one because it literally doesn't matter. It's just they get to roll the die. Mm -hmm. Um... Because it's not a may, it's a must. Like, they must roll a die, so, okay. Subsystems upon subsystems. Right, like, just somebody rolls a stupid dice. Great, okay, who cares? Um, yeah. Good scoring, good deployment, good objective layout. No shooting over 12, no spell casting over 12, no flying. If the last one was a huge penalty to melee armies, this one is a huge penalty to shooting and spell casting armies. Right, um, while highly benefiting melee armies are people who want to like use their, most of their spells for buffing, right? Mm. Um, terrain density matters a lot, a lot. Yep, yep. Because the losing the flight. If you're playing with a heavy terrain density and big pieces of terrain, all of a sudden everybody's army not flying means the game becomes like a slog real fast, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought we stopped shutting off army mechanics. I thought we stopped doing this. Three out of ten. Stop shutting off army mechanics. I rated the other one a three out of ten. Tom, I'm consistent. No, you are. And and I appreciate that. But 
Like, again, if you're going to do any one of these objectives, TOs, I think you need to do all of them. Mm. Do you feel meaningfully different if it's 18 inches instead of 12? I mean, it's a Doesn't huge it... change. But, like, it's, it's, it's an not... absolutely titanic change if it's 18 instead of 12. Then yeah. I don't think it's doing anything. We just shouldn't do this. Night mm. fighting was never fun in 40K. Like, it's just not mm. fun. Stop it. Yeah, yeah, at that point, you're just affecting some shooting, but mostly, yeah, you're not doing anything to magic. Yeah. Like, Zinch's kill box is, is still in effect, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they have their their, um, their kill box gets slightly shortened, but it's not hugely, yes. Sure. Zinch's yeah. normal kill box is, is, is 16 to 18 inches, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Like, mid-range. Yeah. I By the way, I Kual said it as well. If you take ice fields, you take this one. Tom, that was the point you were making. I tend to agree. Like, I think these are a pair. If we're going to mm -hmm. take the one that screws the melee armies, we got to take the one that screws the shooting armies. Like, these have to... If you're going to take one, you've got to put both bad bad battle plans in your pack together. So everybody can just have a... So everybody can have a bad time at least one round. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. Yep. It's a problem. Yeah. So. Yep. Like, and the and by the way, those need to be in rounds like two, three, and four for the sure. TOs that are watching. Those just, are just, not round one. Those are not round five matches. Pack them in. All right. No reward without risk. Uh, opposite corner to corner with a five objective spread and across. Uh, this one needs an FAQ as well. I assume. Yeah. Because right now the deployment just says wholly within your territory. There's no more than nine inches away. So, like, there is no current minimum. You could just set up, I guess, in combat. <laughs> right? So, like, uh, yep. you could just, like, be on the corner, reluctantly crouched at the starting line. Uh, <laughs> you could just be right up there, baby. Mm. Um, so... I assume that'll be FAQ'd because you shouldn't. We shouldn't have scenarios where you can set up in combat. That's probably weird. Mm. Um. So sure. And then feedback overload. When a wizard is slain before removing that model from play, roll a die on a four up. The wizard explodes as their magical en energies are released uncontrollably. Each unit within a number of inches equal to the wounds characteristic of that wizard suffers D three mortal wounds. Roll separately for each unit. Uh. 7 out of 10. Scoring, deployment. Uh, again, I'm assuming the FAQ. So I'm just going to... That's mm. what I'm saying. This for. The 7 out of 10 is assuming the FAQ. Um, so, the, you know, the downside is starting with a few inches of enemy. So this one does do some weird mortal wounds thing, but I'm totally willing for it here because it has a really easy trigger to remember, which is mm. the wizard died and they explode. Honestly, this one might be an 8 out of 10 for me. In fact, it's an 8 out of 10. I'm just going to assume the FAQ, no, and I'm, I'm going to I knew. 10. As soon as it said wizards explode, I knew <laughs> Vince was in on that. <laughs> this is fantastic. Like, what a fun time. Like, cool, man. Like, now we're right... Now we're pod racing, okay? Like, this is, this is where we should be. <laughs> units exploding and killing other units is really fun to me. I love it. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Tom, what do you think? Um. Oh, it's side fine. note. I love that it's a, a number of inches equal to the wounds characteristic of the wizard. So if you kill some like mounted fourteen wound wizard, it's just like this <laughs> nuke goes off. It's just like chain chain reaction. Yeah. It's oh, great. Ar Archeon wipes half the board. With yeah, just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is uh, great. It's fine. It's fine. Like, I like the deployment situation. Um, that's interesting to me. Um, if they do let you set up a combat, you mean, or, or period? No, just, just like, even if it's nine inches off. Like, sure. I like this type of, like, uh, cross uh, deployment diagonal. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, again, this is another one where, like, having a wizard is a problem. Because yeah, if you sure. get alpha... Like, if you get alpha, you could set off nukes in your army. Yeah, just additional wizard cascade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a real thing. Um, and so, and I don't think that we, like, I don't think that people will have really thought through the consequence of this until they play it a couple times. 
Especially yeah. if you have a lot of splash mortal wounds where like multiple wizards are getting weakened simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Like, man, Seraphon are excited about this with the salon. Just like yep. <laughs> <laughs> secondary yep. explosions. So, yeah, uh, the first thought I had with this one is maybe a good or a decent game one. Like, a game one fun mission. Uh, sure. Round, round one, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, that that's often a slot for for something a little weird and wacky, but fun. Kick off a tournament, and then and then you do more the more stable and, and serious battle plans afterwards. <laughs> the the objective placement. I mean, this was focal points, not the territory layout, but this was yeah. this uh, this five objectives. This was focal points at one point. And it was a it was a solid mission. I, it was actually I think it was slightly no I take that back. Focal points was slightly different, but kind of a similar kind of box in the middle. But the, of course, you can play six inches contesting right contesting objectives on the west north you know all of those you can actually be fairly spread out to where yeah you can minimize some of that potential blowback potential note going off so i think you might end up playing more of the board than you're thinking uh than one might be thinking so yeah i i generally like this one even though it could get really crazy yeah so all i'm gonna say is this um man this is this is making like a they have a one constellation of just terrible objectives or like terrible scenarios that that will create a truly memorable and probably not in a good way event <laughs> um for the for the to that just chains all of these like sure. <laughs> super hard counter scenarios together oh, and just, yeah yeah like just... start with this then we go to the ice fields then we go to the you know <laughs> and, uh, and so on yeah, no, no way but forward. Just like the 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 Iron Man tournament you can build here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Game one, my mm-hmm. wizards exploded. Then people died for running and charging. And then I couldn't and then see couldn't anything. See. Good, good work, Tom. You just brought this into existence. This tournament is not horrible. Going to exist. Yeah, the Iron Man <laughs> tournament. Yeah. All right, last one, worst uh-huh. one. This is your game five. In in, in the oh, Iron Man God. tournament, this is your game yeah. five. <laughs> Miserable. <laughs> oh, I hate this mission. Uh, as do I. I I tell you straight up, I think this is a this is just bad, 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 bad. Like in every single way. Oh. Okay. Two objectives, wide deployment. The battlefield, at least one defensible terrain feature that is neither large nor very large, must be set up wholly within each territory and more than nine inches from enemy territory. Deployment, wholly within your territory and more than nine inches away, each player chooses one defensible terrain feature or faction terrain feature wholly within their territory to represent a wizard's tower. I cannot wait for people, for corn skull altar players to choose the skull altar as their wizard tower. The irony is rich. Wizard Towers have the Arcane Scenery Rule in addition to any other scenery rules they have. Uh, scoring. Uh, hold one, hold two. There's only two objectives. So, okay. No, no hold more. Um, fine. And in addition, each player scores victory points at the end of the battle round as follows. If friendly units are garrisoning the Wizard's Tower in your territory, or... If your starting army did not include any units that could garrison a terrain feature, and you control the Wizard's Tower in your territory, you get two victory points. Okay. Okay. So, so like, the Sons of Bamak could just stand around the tower and, and control it, obviously. That checks However, out. If there are no units garrisoning the Wizard's Tower in enemy territory, it's 2vp. So the... The opponent, when the Suns player plays the opponent, right, then the, they can garrison their own tower and score two, and they're automatically going to get two because nobody's garrisoning the other tower. So they get all, but they get four, right? Whereas the person who doesn't have the garrison, right, and just controls it, only gets two as long as mm. somebody stays in the other one. You with me? You understand what I'm yep. saying here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like. Now, by the way, that's at the end of the battle. It's at the end of the battle. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yes. Did I say battle round? I might have. Yeah. I don't know if I did. So or... we're playing. I apologize a... if I did. In the end of the we're, battle, I think the... we're playing a siege game with two objectives. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. This is all white noise to me, gentlemen. Sorry, I'm, I'm checking. I'm upside, checked out the mission. only upside here is simple deployment. Yeah, exactly. Downside, <sighs> two objectives is bad. Even with the fake towers, defensible terrain is bad. Garrisoning is a challenge. Like, it's just every part of this is a non-starter. Two of, like, it's just, it's bad, bad, bad. Fundamentally at its bones, it's a one out of ten. It's a nope. It's Man, nope. I think it sounds like a great game five in the Iron Man tournament. Yeah. So, like, the Iron Man tournament is Wizards Explode, Ice Fields, Can't See Anything, uh, uh, what's our fourth one? Uh, uh, hold on. Is that Frigid Zephyr? Frigid Zephyr? Uh. Have you said that one? The, the no shooting one? Pro no, the, uh, lines of communication, or, no. No, the not. every step is forward where you can't retreat. That's, that's the one. Oh, that's yeah. the only good one out of there. And then you end on on uh, Towers in the Tundra, which I also didn't finish the wording from. That's fine. Yeah, somebody brought it up. I, I Like I said, white noise, so you may have mentioned that. Did you cover how the core rules right now as warded break this mission? With, with the it. way that... No, I didn't even get into that. I, we don't need to get into that, but go ahead. Yeah, well, just that you have to be able to garrison a terrain feature to be able to control it. So... Yeah, if friendly units are like, where is it in here? That again, if I'm friendly just, units like, are garrisoning noise. the wizard's tower in your territory, or if your starting army did not include any units that could garrison, that could garrison, and you can, yeah. and you control the wizard's tower. You know, so I, 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 I don't know. I guess maybe you could argue it's fine, but no enemy units are garrisoning. I don't know. I hate this mission. I don't even yeah. want to think about it anymore. <laughs> I agree. This is like uh, unless you're playing the Iron Man punishing tournament. Like, hey, yeah. hey, come on in, masochists. Who who wants to have a bad time playing Warhammer? I've got the tournament for you. There Are it, you there. tired of your armies being effective, <laughs> playing with your rules? Yeah. Not losing troops randomly for no reason under your control? Then I've got the tournament for you. <laughs> yeah. Warble, defensible terrain features are controlled by the player who has any units garrisoning them. That's it. That was the, yeah, that's the core rules wording that breaks yes. this. We're assuming that basically this is allowing you to, yeah, to like take it as per normal terrain and it's basically busting those rules. But yes, Sacred right, Maximus, sure. I can't wait to see the results of the NPE Invitational. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that's what it is, the NPE Invitational Tournament. Yep. <laughs> yep. Now, uh, so, so what's, the, what's the total score here to me? Uh... The total score here to me is you got 12, 12 things. I think seven to eight of them are perfectly viable and playable, which is honestly fine with me. Mm. That's that's great. So, like, let's just uh, very quickly mm. end yes, on this I'm and go them. through it, okay? Yeah. Geomantic Pulse. Yeah. Good. One. Yeah. Nexus Collapse. Two. Good. Yeah. Lines of Communication. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe that's maybe that's your round four. By the way, there you go. That's that's your round four. Okay, that's that's the skip. <laughs> um, every step is forward. Three. Uh, yeah. Limited resources. Four. Spring yeah. the trap. Five. Again, assuming the FAQ. Fountains yeah. of Lost. Yeah. Six. Cool. Yeah. Um, ice fields. Nope. Power flux. Seven. Yeah. 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 Swingy, but it's, it's probably coming. okay. Uh, yeah. Frigid Zephyr. Nope. No reward without risk. Eight. Like, yeah. Like, and again, there's probably a. I could live. I'm on the cusp with maybe one of those, but like, you know. Yeah. yeah. There, there's eight here that I think yeah. are are all tournament ready. Bottom line. Okay. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah, we were we were essentially uh I think seven plus realmstone cash as an eight I think sure. last yeah. season. So. Yeah. So like we're we're on point. <laughs> like. We got to stop writing these these. Let's go make people feel bad for playing their army battle plans. But other than that, like these are pretty good. There was no like absolute ten out of tens for me here, but for the most no. part, it was a lot of solid work. Like, uh, like a full seven of these, I actually like and think are really really well designed. And then there's an eighth one that's like, yeah, it's good enough. Yeah, we've got more mission uh, more missions this season where we're playing across the board a little bit more than last season. Obviously, last season was a lot of in the middle. You know, I have four. Let's see, we've got three, four objectives, one, five objective, four, six objectives. 
Uh, I think one of those might be a bad mission, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's it's nice to see that. Yeah, the the ice fields is one of the is one of the six. Yeah. So so yeah, that's nice. Play playing more platonic Warhammer. Absolutely. All right, final thoughts, gentlemen. Let's call it a day. See, I told you it wouldn't be that long. I knew the battle plans would be relatively quick. So. Yeah. Okay. Tyler, final thoughts. Well, let's. Yeah, I'm about a seven, seven and a half for this season. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I, yeah, we've, yeah, that's where I'm at. That's my. Very good, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Final thoughts. It's a six. Like I'll play it, and it's better than the last season, last two seasons. But it's, uh, it's definitely like depending upon scenario choices, it could be better or worse. Sure. Yeah, my read is what's so funny about this season and what I talked about is I felt like I was starting very negative, even though I had a lot of good things to say, because the fundamental bones of this season, I actually really like the battle mm. plans. I like most of them, like two thirds of them. I'd be happy to roll up and play at any turn. Yeah. You could grab any five in the storm of those eight. And I'd be like, this is going to be five good rounds of Warhammer. The battle mm. tactics are good. The grand strats, I feel like I've got three options, right? The fundamental bones of the primary loop of this game, this is one of the best design seasons we've done. Mm -hmm. Okay? I, I would throw the endless spells in there as well, potentially. I mean, it, it, with the potential asterisk of we'll see how prevalent they are, but in terms of, like, sure, I really sure. like the, the, the set that we've gotten. Uh, agreed. Like, we'll get to that probably next week. Yeah. Right? But, like, when, when we have points and stuff, points dependent. But, like, so much of the yeah. bones of this I really like. It's just, once again, I really feel like we're going to have the wizard season featuring nobody's playing wizards except the people who are already playing wizards and are now going to beat people up even more with them. What a great mm, time. Yep. Right? Yep. Everybody else go anti-magic or get hosed. And so, yep. like, that's my concern. That extra weight on that front stuff is just too heavy, too narrative, too much for what is otherwise a really mm. great battle pack. Mm-hmm. Right, mm -hmm. like that, I'm excited to play. Like I, I'm excited to do these battle tactics, these scenarios, these strats. Yeah. Like the the new endless spells, I agree with you. Like even some of the, even like if you just had the new spells, I think the spells are cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> like all that stuff, good, 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 good. Just that fundamental realm rule stuff is just too much. It's just yeah. too much. I didn't say. I mean, I, I thought there was some real creativity in some of these battle plans, like you know, really stretching, you know, new ground that they've covered with this pack than in, in all prior packs. So yeah, I, agree. So I do real, think this is work. the best battle plan pack we've had in, <clears throat> in a long time, maybe ever. Mm. It's con the consistency of it really, mm. really hits me. So, yeah. Okay. Good. What do you think out there? Give us your vote. Comment down below. Tell us what uh, what you think of it, what you're excited for in the season, what you're not sure about, all that kind of thing. Shout it out. Uh, hey, if you didn't yet hit like, you should do that. There's, there's, It's so easy and really helps other people find the show, and we really appreciate it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Of course, we're here every week talking Age of Sigmar, bringing you all the hottest goss and insights and nonsensory. So, you know, click those things that make little dings. Uh, as long as you're not Tom, who uh, is just apparently unmuted at all points in time. Uh, <laughs> if you want to support the channel, you can do so. There's a Patreon down there focused on your review and feedback for your hobby, uh, taking your next step on your hobby journey. As always, though, we thank you so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time.